Hey, Duvid here. We are live for first in the series of my multiple truth hypothesis and a series on the philosophy and history of science. So thank God I have, uh, sorry, let me uh, put up a few links. But uh, I had, uh, you completed my tour of my library, and Jennifer had, it had issues with her scheduling, so we can review, which had been for, for a few years now, Sunday nights, uh, may have to be moved to another time. So we'll see about that. We did it Monday night for a few weeks. I think this week it will probably be Thursday, and we'll see about that uh, moving forward. So I have a lot to cover. Let me just do a quick um, screen share. Sorry about that. I'm uh, trying to uh, – okay, so sorry about my uh, dead time here. Just trying to uh, – get myself ready. I have a lot to cover and I might even do two streams this week. So here's the blog post I wrote on the origins and basics of my multiple truth hypothesis. I'd read it in a past stream and I mentioned the idea came out of interfaith, mainly dealing with um, Islamic Judaic interfaith, uh, interfaith in general with concepts of eschatology, cosmology, things specific to religion. And then when I started doing Week in Review or streaming, I talked a lot more about science. And in relationship to science, I thought the multiple truth hypothesis was actually probably more useful. And I had desires to actually create the multiple truth hypothesis as a formal theory uh, that might even uh, have a mathematical, logical formulation. Um, but most likely, the multiple truth hypothesis would be related to metaphysics, although it might have applications in multiple fields. But uh, the most important probably to cover will start with the philosophy of science. And then from there, I'll move more into metaphysics, specifically with like dualism, spirituality, of the soul where you have vastly divergent explanatory systems. However, it seems that the best method to start to explain the multiple truth hypothesis is specifically within the field of science. And you know, I mentioned some of the precursors. You can see you know, I finished the whole long series on the tour of my library. So surprisingly, the most popular of the tour of my library was my math and physics books. So I had the most view hours on Freemasonry, um, but uh, you're close to 900 views on the my math and physics books. So that was actually the subject that I thought might get uh, the least uh, positive reception. So I was surprised, and I saw that most of my views on math and physics. A Mames, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, really enjoyed your Stephen Wolfron interview. Uh, congrats on on getting that up. I have some very interesting. Uh, literature to uh, go through tonight. And yeah, I mean, Jennifer, we've moved uh, week in review, so it's going to be Thursday this week. So of all of my tour of my libraries, you could see uh, I did 20 different uh, videos touring my library and, you know, like a lot of books. And I finally finished uh, the section. And so I'm putting, you know, my Ask the Rabbi, hopefully I'll have a few more of these. So I'm putting these this one in my public study sessions, and you could see in my public study ses sessions, I had already done a few. Um, you know, last week in review, I mentioned art of debate, rhetoric, communication theory, um, but I had already done a handful of videos uh, on the multiple truth hypothesis, and they were kind of not a a full formation of the ideas, 
but uh, you know, some of the precursor ideas, so I'd, I'd mentioned uh, um, you know, the philosophical bath background of empiricism and rationalism, um, this paper by famous geologist in 1890, Chamberlain, the method of multiple working hypothesis that was uh, specific just to geology, uh, scientific realism within the philosophy of science, um, and cognitive dissonance, and, and then, so I did quite a few videos on this, sorry, and, and uh, you know, that had similar topics. So I also covered uh, the multiverse theories of physics. I read through some of Max Tegmark's works. I looked briefly at the holographic universe. These are topics I plan on coming back to. I read a few of Te uh, Max Tegmark's paper and uh, Henry Bergson. And then I talked about some of the chess studies in relationship to the theory of expertise. And then I had went into chess and expertise. So that's, I think, all the videos. I think I just had those two videos on, no, I had one more on... Uh, in, in relationship to alpha fold AI. So that's a little bit of the precursor of the research I've done, you know, put out on my channel of um, the multiple truth hypothesis. So memes, I actually, yeah, I looked on my YouTube stats and a lot of the people came to my video just searching for math and physics books. And part of when I started streaming you know, like I've done a lot of research. I was like tour the library. Uh, you know, like um, I've taken a lot of university classes, a lot of online courses, teaching company. I'm constantly reading and studying. And you know, at some point, I've in certain fields, I've ran out of content. There really just isn't that much good content on the subject. And I feel like I've researched the subject as much or more than a lot of the people putting out content on it. So I wanted to you know maybe try to create community. And like, you know, like, so memes, you know, he's been interviewing Stephen Wolfram, which is, uh, you know, paralleled. So, you know, like I've read some of Wolfram's books, um, you know, the certain level where I'm up to date on my research. I know the big names in the field. And so this video is part of the due diligence of the historical background. And, and uh, I've watched through quite a bit of material. There's like Kane B., there's a few other people that regularly put out philosophy of science videos. There's a few online college courses, introductory courses, some nice PowerPoints. Um, I mean, in, in science of philosophy of science is a tough subject. Uh, you know, so a lot of times there'll be like an introductory uh, undergraduate course that gives a little bit of an overview, but it's really a deep subject. And there's a certain level where there's a lot of prerequisite information, and uh, you know, a lot of times it requires uh, you really a mastery of a lot of levels of science. So yeah, I'm going to look a little later at the philosophy of technology. So you could be into the philosophy of science without being a scientist, and then there's the philosophy of science specifically for scientists, for people who understand uh, you the current scientific theories. And then there's also the precursor to me getting into this is metaphysics and spirituality to say, what does science explain? What is the boundary of science? Where, what is the limits of the explanatory power of science and something like spirituality, philosophy, metaphysics coming in to explain other things. And we can review, we went to this in great detail about uh, you know the scientific revolution, uh, the Galilean. Um, uh, I mean, if you're around memes and you even want to pop on real quick and talk, you can, because I'm going to be doing a lot of reading, and uh, I probably have like two, three hours of reading. So let me just show some of the stuff here. So I finally got some highlighting software. So you know, because I'm doing a lot of reading. And so I found a, an app that I could add. So I was able to do some highlights. So I, I took some stuff from Wikipedia and from the Stanford Encyclopedia. And actually, I only 
got through like a third of what I what I you know read through or or your research and you know, it's really an endless topic. So that's why I figured I just stream tonight and start putting this some stuff out there. I'm going to look at a little bit of uh, the precursors, the philosophy of science, uh, and it's going to get much more technical and in depth into the conception here. Um, scientific representation. I have others on models, like what what is a scientific model? What does science do? And then this will probably maybe even three or four parts. And maybe, you know, as I start talking through this, I'll be able to work in my mind. Maybe I'll write an essay and I'll do a little overview on some of the history of science. And then from there, I'm probably going to backtrack to the metaphysics of, uh, of, uh, in philosophy going back to like Descartes and dualism and a more clear understanding of what exactly does science entail uh, and differentiating certain things like mathematics, logic, philosophy, metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, and what are the crossovers and what are the boundaries between the various fields. And, uh, you know, because science is like a catch-all word. It could have a a broad or narrow definition. And you, when I call my hypothesis the multiple truth hypothesis, I specifically use the word truth. And there's a connection between like science and truth. However, truth is not necessarily a claim of science. Truth is more generally a claim of propositional logic and of possibly philosophy and whether science is indicative of truth of all uh, truth at all is actually a question of the philosophy of science and you'll see that the multiple truth hypothesis will say well what is the truth of science and what is the relative truth of science in comparison to other fields and so tonight i'm going to look at thomas hobbes which has some of the precursors of the scientific method applied to other fields. Yeah. So memes, I probably have a few hours of reading a lot of stuff to cover. So let me jump right in and we'll just look at what is the philosophy of science. And I figure I'll just read sections from the Wikipedia and then make some points off of it just to get, uh, you know, a little bit of overview because there's a lot of names, a lot of time and just some of the due diligence to, uh, you get a little of, uh, important information out there. Okay, philosophy of science. Philosophy of science is a branch of philosophy concerned with the foundations, methods, and implications of science. The central question of this study concerns what qualifies as science, the reliability of scientific theories, and the ultimate purpose of science. The discipline overlaps with metaphysics, ontology, and epistemology, for example, when it explores the relationship between science and truth. Philosophy of science focuses on metaphysical, epistemic, and semantic aspects of science. Well, philosoph well philosophical thought pertaining to science dates back to at least the time of Aristotle. General philosophy of science emerged as a distinct discipline only in the 20th century in the wake of the logical positivist movement, which aimed to formulate criteria for ensuring all philosophical statements meaningful and objectively assessing them. Charles Sanders Pierce and Karl Popper moved on from positivism to establish a modern set of standards for scientific methodology. Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, was also formative, challenging the view of scientific progress as the steady cumulative acquisition of knowledge based on a fixed method of systematic experimentation. And instead of arguing that any progress is relative to a paradigm, the set of questions, concerns, and practices that define a scientific discipline in a particular historic period. And I'm going to go over uh, more in depth, Hannes Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, actually a book that I had uh, read in high school, my dad had had on his shelf. Subsequently, the coherentist approach to science in which a theory is validated if it makes sense 
of observations as part of a coherent whole became prominent due to Quine and others. Some things or such as Stephen Jay Gould seek to ground science in axiomatic assumptions, such as the uniformity of nature, a vocal minority of philosophers, um, Paul Feyerbend in particular, argue that there's no such thing as a scientific method. So all approaches to science should be allowed, including explicitly supernatural ones. Another approach to thinking about science involves studying how knowledge is created from a sociological perspective. Defining science. Distinguishing between science and non-science is referred to as the demarcation problem. Karl, Mar Karl Popper called this central question, this the central question in the philosophy of science. Early attempts by the logical positives grounded science in observation, while non-science was non-observational and hence meaningless. Popper argued that the central property of science is falsibility, that is, every genuinely scientific claim is capable of being proven false, at least in principle. Scientific explanation. A closely related question is what counts as good scientific explanation? In addition to providing predictions about future events, society often takes scientific theories to provide explanations for events that occur regularly or have already occurred. Philosophers have investigated the criteria by which a scientific theory can be said to have successfully explained phenomenon, as well as what it means to say scientific theory has explanatory power. One early and influential account of scientific explanation is the deductive nominological model, it says that a successive scientific explanation must deduce the occurrence of the phenomenon in question from a scientific law. This view has been subjected to substantial criticism, resulting in several widely acknowledged counterexamples to the theory. It is especially challenging to characterize what is meant by an explanation when the thing to be explained cannot be deduced from any law because it is a matter of chance or otherwise cannot be perfectly predicted from what is known. Wesley Salmon developed a model in which good scientific explanation must be statistically relevant to the outcome to be explained. Others have argued that the key to a good explanation is unifying disparate phenomenon or providing causal mechanisms. And I'm actually going to go substantially into detail into almost all of these things that I'm reading about. So I'm just starting with a basic overview just so people can have an outline of what is entailed in the philosophy of science. And we'll go into in depth and we'll see that almost all of these have multiple models, uh, multiple names, multiple theoreticians, and there's substantial overlap. So uh, it was even hard for me to plot this out. So I figured I'd just jump right in. Although it is often taken for granted, it is not at all clear how one can infer the validity of a general statement from a number of specific instances or infer the truth of a theory from a series of successful tests. One approach is to acknowledge that induction cannot achieve certainty, but observing more instances of a general statement can at least make the general statement more probable. However, there remain difficult questions about the process of interpreting any given evidence into a probability that the general statement is true. One way out of these particular difficulties is to declare that all beliefs about scientific theories are subjective or personal, and correct reasoning is merely about how evidence should change one's subjective beliefs over time. Some argue that what scientists do is not inductive reasoning at all, but rather abductive reasoning or inference to the best explanation. In this account, science is not about generalizing specific instances, but rather about hypothesizing explanations for what is observed. As discussed in the previous section, it's not always clear what is meant by the best explanation. Occam's razor, which counsels choosing the simplest available explanation, thus plays an important role in some versions of this approach. Philosophers have tried to make this heuristic more precise in terms of theoretical parsimony or other measures. Yet although various measures of simplicity have been brought forward as potential candidates, it is generally accepted that there is no such thing as a theory-independent measure of simplicity. In other words, there appear to be as many different measures of simplicity as there are theories themselves, and the task of choosing between measures of simplicity appears to be in every bit as problematic as the job of choosing between theories. Nicholas Maxwell has argued for some decades that unity rather than simplicity is the key non-empirical factor in influencing, influencing choice of theory and science. Persistent preference for unified theories, in effect, 
committing science to the acceptance of the metaphysical thesis concerning unity in nature. In order to improve these problematic theses, it needs to be represented in the form of hierarchy of theses, each thesis thesis becoming more insubstantial as one goes up in the hierarchy. Observation inseparable from theory. Generally, I'm not reading the example part, so uh, I'm just reading the theoretical uh, definition without any of the examples, and hopefully I will give my own examples as we go on. All observation involves both perception and cognition. That is, one does not make an observation passively, but rather is actively engaged in distinguishing the phenomenon being observed from surrounding sensory data. Therefore, observations are affected by one's underlying understanding of the way in which the world functions, and that understanding may influence what is perceived, noticed, or deemed worthy of consideration. In this sense, it can be argued that all observation is theory-laden. The purpose of science. Should science aim to determine ultimate truth, or are there questions that science cannot answer? Scientific realists claim that science aims at truth and that one ought to regard scientific theories as true, approximately true, or likely true. Conversely, scientific anti-realists argue that science does not claim, or at least does not succeed at truth, especially truth about observables like electrons or other universes. Instrumentalists argue that scientific theories should only be evaluated on whether they are useful. In their view, whether theories are true or not is besides the point, because the purpose of science is to make predictions and enable effective technology. Realists often point to the success of recent scientific theories as evidence for the truth or near truth of current theories. Anti-realists point to either the many false theories in the history of science, epistemic morals, the success of false modeling assumptions, or widely termed postmodern criticisms of objectivity as evidence against scientific realism. Anti-realists attempt to explain the success of scientific theories without reference to truth, some anti-realists claim that scientific theories aim at being accurate only about observable objects and argue that their success is primarily judged by that criterion. So my earlier videos on the multiple truth hypothesis, I specifically went into the topic of scientific realism in relationship to truth. So today I'm not going to be focusing so much on the philosophical concept of truth, but the philosophy of science, what is science, what does science do? What is uh, within the boundary of science? What is outside of the boundary? Values in science. Values intersect with science in different ways. There are epistemic values that mainly guide scientific research. The scientific enterprise is embedded in a particular culture and values through individual practitioners. Values emerge from science both as product and process and can be distributed among several cultures and society. When it comes to the justification of science, in the sense of general public participation by single practitioners, science plays the role of mediator between evaluating the standards and policies of society and its particular individuals, wherefore science indeed falls victim to the vandalism and sabotage adapted, adapting the means to the end. If it is unclear what counts as science, how the process of confirming theories work, and what the purpose of science is, there's considerable scope for values and other social influences to shape science. Indeed, values can play a role in ranging from determining which research gets funded to influencing which theories achieve scientific consensus. It's so the history. And as I said, I hope to move into a general history of science, but I wanted to first cover the philosophy of science uh, as a precursor before moving into uh, some topics within the history of science and beyond my scope to do a you know, full history of science uh, course, you know, you could look online. There's not really too many good history of science courses, but uh, you know, one of that would uh, be hundreds of hours. But uh, I will probably do topics within the history of science once I've covered the philosophy of science uh, in order to analyze the history of science. The origins of philosophy of science straight back to Plato and Aristotle, who distinguished the forms of approximate and exact reasoning, set out the threefold schema of of abductive, deductive, and inductive inference, and also analyze reasoning by analogy. The 11th century Arab polymath, Ibn al-Hatham, uh, conducted his research in optics by way of controlled experimental testing 
and applied geometry, especially in his investigations into the images resulting from the reflection and refraction of light. Roger Bacon, an English thinker and experimenter heavily influenced by Al Hatham, is recognized by many to be the father of my, the modern scientific method. His view that mathematics was essential to a correct understanding of natural philosophy is considered to have been 400 years ahead of its time. Francis Bacon was a seminal figure in the philosophy of science at the time of the scientific revolution. In his work, Novum Organum, 1620, in allusion to Aristotle's Organon, Bacon outlined a new system of logic to improve upon the old philosophical process of syllogism. Bacon's method relied on experimental histories to eliminate alternative theories. In 1637, René Descartes established a new framework for grounding scientific knowledge in his treatise, Discourse on Method, advocating for the central role of reason as opposed to sensory experience. By contrast, in 1713, the second edition of Isaac Newton's Philosophy, the natural principles of mathematics, argued that hypotheses have no place in experimental philosophies. In this philosophy, propositions are deduced from the phenomenon and rendered general by induction. The passage influenced a later generation of philosophically inclined readers to pronounce a ban on causal hypotheses in natural philosophy. In particular, later in the 18th century, David Hume would famously articulate skepticism about the ability of science to determine causality and gave a definitive formulation of the problem of induction. The 19th century writings of John Stuart Mill are also considered important in the formation of current conceptions of the scientific method, as well as anticipating later accounts of scientific explanation. Logical positivism. Instrumentalists became popular among the physicists around the turn of the 20th century, after which logical positivism defined the field for several decades. Logical positivism accepts only testable statements as meaningful, rejects metaphysical interpretations, and embraces, embraces verificationalism, a set of theories of knowledge that combines logicism, empiricism, and linguistics to ground philosophy on basis consistent with examples from the empirical sciences. Seeking to overhaul all philosophy and convert it to a new scientific philosophy, the Berlin Circle and the Vienna Circle propounded logical positivism in the late 1920s. Interpreting Ludwig Wittgenstein's early philosophy of language, logical positivists identified a verifiable uh, ability principle or criterion of cognitive meaningfulness. From Bertrand Russell's logicism, they sought reduction of mathematics to logic. They embraced Russell's logical atomism, Ernst Mach phenomenalism, whereby the mind knows only actual or potentially sensory experience, which is the content of all science, whether physics or psychology, and Percy Bridgman's operationalism. Thereby, only the verifiable was scientific and cognitively meaningful, whereby the unverifiable was unscientific, cognitively meaningless, pseudo statements, metaphysical, emotive, or such not worthy for further review by philosophers who were newly tasked to organize knowledge rather than develop new knowledge. Logical positivism is commonly portrayed as taking the extreme position that scientific language should never refer to anything unobservable, even the, the seemingly core notions of causality, mechanisms, and principles, but that is an exaggeration. Talk of such unobservables could be allowed as metaphorical direct observations viewed in the abstract or at worst metaphysical or emotional. Theoretical laws would be reduced to empirical laws, while theoretical terms would garner meaning from observational terms via correspondence rules. Mathematics and physics would reduce to symbolic logic via logicism, while rational reconstruction would convert ordinary language into standardized equivalents, all networked and unified by a logical syntax. A scientific theory would be stated with its method of verification, whereby a logical calculus or empirical operation could verify its falsity or truth. In the late 1930s, logical positivists fled Germany and Austria for Britain and America. By then, many had replaced Max phenomenalism with Otto Neurath's physicalism, and Rudolf Carnap had sought to replace verification with simply confirmation. With World War II's close in 1945, logical positivism became milder logical empiricism, led largely by Karl Hemper, Hempel in America, who expounded the covering law model of scientific explanation, 
as a way of identifying the logical form of explanation without any reference to the suspect notion of causation. The logical positivist movement became a major underpinning of analytical philosophy and dominated, dominated anglo sphere philosophy, including philosophy of science, while well influencing science in the 1960s. Yet the movement failed to resolve its central problems and its doctrines were increasingly assaulted. Nevertheless, it brought about the establishment of philosophy of science as a distinct subdiscipline of philosophy with Carl Hempel playing a key role. Thomas Kuhn, who will uh, be a very important figure, specifically today I will cover uh, a lot of Thomas Kuhn, in the 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn argued that the process of observation and evaluation takes place within a paradigm, a logically consistent portrait of the world that is consistent with observations made from its framing. A paradigm also encompasses the set of questions and practices that define a scientific discipline. He characterized normal science as the process of observation and puzzle solving, which takes place within a paradigm, whereas revolutionary science occurs when one paradigm overtakes another in a paradigm shift. Kuhn denied that it is ever possible to isolate the hypothesis being tested from the influence of the theory in which the observations are grounded, and he argued that it is not possible to evaluate competing paradigms independently. More than one logically consistent construct can paint a usable likeness of the world, but there's no common ground for which to pit two against each other, theory against theory. Each paradigm has its own distinct questions, aims, and interpretations. Neither provides a standard by which the other can be judged, so there's no clear way to measure scientific progress across paradigms. For Kuhn, the choice of paradigm was sustained by rational processes, but not ultimately determined by them. The choice between paradigms involves setting two or more portraits against the world and deciding which likeness is most promising. For Kuhn, acceptance or rejection of a paradigm is a social process as much as a logical process. Kuhn's position, however, is not one of relativism. According to Kuhn, a paradigm shift occurs when a significant number of observational anomalies arise in the old paradigm, and a new paradigm makes sense of them. This is, that is, the choice of new paradigm is based on observation, even though those observations are made against the background of the old paradigm. So, modern approaches. Naturalistic axiomatic assumptions. All scientific study inescapably builds on at least some essential assumptions that are untested by scientific processes. Kuhn concurs that all science is based on an approved agenda of unprovable assumptions about the character of the universe rather than merely on empirical facts. These assumptions of paradigm comprise a collection of beliefs, values, and techniques that are held by a given scientific community which legitimize their systems and set the limitations to their investigation. For a naturalist, nature is the only reality, the only paradigm. There's no such thing as supernatural. The scientific method is to be used to investigate all reality, and naturalism is the implicit philosophy of working scientists. The following basic assumptions are needed to justify the scientific method. That there is an objective reality shared by all rational observers. The basis for rational Rationality is acceptance of an external objective reality. As an individual, we cannot know that the sensory information we perceive is generated artificially or originates from a real world. Any belief that arises from a real world outside us is actually an assumption. It seems more beneficial to assume that an objective reality exists than to live with solipsism, and so people are quite happy to make this assumption. In fact, we made this assumption unconsciously when we began to learn about the world as infants. The world outside ourselves appears to respond in ways which are consistent with being real. The assumption of objectivism is essential if we are to attach the contemporary meaning of our sensations and feelings and make more sense of them. Without this assumption, there would be only the thoughts and images of our own mind, which would be the only existing mind, and there would be no need of science or anything else. Number two, that the objective reality is governed by natural laws. Science, at least today, assumes that the universe obeys to knowable principles that don't depend on time or place, nor on subjective parameters such as what we think, know, or how we behave. Hugauch argues that science presupposes the physical world is orderly and comprehensible. Hey, John, thanks for tuning in. Three, that reality can be discovered by means of a systemic observation and experimentation. Stanley Sabatka said the assumption of externally 
rea external reality is necessary for science to function and to flourish. For the most part, science is the discovering and explaining the of the external world. Science attempts to produce knowledge that is as universal and objective as possible within the realm of human understanding. Four, that nature has uniformity of laws and most of, if not all things of nature, must at least have a natural cause. Biologist Stephen Jay Gould referred to these closely related propositions as the constancy of nature's laws and the operation of known processes. Simpson agrees that the axiom of uniformity of laws an unprovable postulate is necessary in order for scientists to extrapolate inductive reference into the unobservable past in order to meaningfully study it. Five, that experimental procedures will be done satisfactory without any deliberate or unintentional mistakes that will influence the results. Six, that experiments won't be significantly biased by their presumptions. Seven, that random sampling is a representation of the entire population. A symptom, ra simple random sample is the most basic probabilistic option used to creating a sample from a population. The benefit of a simple random sample is that the investigator is guaranteed to choose a sample that represents the population that stir ensures statistically valid conclusions. Coherentism. In contrast to the view that science rests on the foundational assumptions, coherentism asserts that statements are justified by being part of a coherent system, or rather individual statements cannot be validated on their own, only coherent systems can be justified. In fact, according to the Duhem-Quine thesis, after Pierre Duhem and uh, W.V. Quine, it is impossible to test a theory in isolation. One must always add auxiliary hypotheses in order to make testable predictions. One consequence of the duham quine hypothesis is that one can make any theory compatible with any empirical observation by the addition of a sufficient number of suitable ad hoc hypotheses. Karl po Popper accepted this thesis, leading him to reject naive falsification. Instead, he favored a survival of the fittest view in which the most falsifiable scientific theories are to be preferred. Paul Feyerbend argued that no description on scientific method could possibly be broad enough to include all the approaches and methods used by scientists, and that there is no useful and exception-free methodological rules governing the progress of science. He argued that the only principle that does not inhibit progress is anything goes. Feyerbaum said that science started as a liberating movement, but that over time it had become increasingly dogmatic and rigid and had some oppressive features and thus became increasingly an ideology. Because of this, he said it was impossible to come up with an unambiguous way to distinguish science from religion, magic, or mythology. He saw the exclusive dominance of science as a means of directing society as authoritarian and ungrounded. Promulgation of this epistemological anarchism earned Feyerbend the title of the worst enemy of science from his detractors. Sociology of Scientific Knowledge Methodology. According to Kuhn, science is inherently communal activity, which can only be done as part of a community. For him, the fundamental difference between science and other disciplines is the way in which communities function. Others, especially Feyerbend and some postmodernist thinkers, have argued that there is insufficient difference between social practices in science and other disciplines to maintain this distinction. For them, social factors play an important and indirect important and direct role in scientific method, but they do not serve to differentiate science from other disciplines. On this account, science is socially constructed, though this does not necessarily imply that the more radical notion that reality itself is a social construct. Michael Foucault sought to analyze and uncover how disciplines within the social scientists developed and adopted the methodologies used by their practitioners. In works like the Archaeology of Knowledge, he used the term human sciences. The human sciences do not comprise mainstream academic disciplines. They are rather an interdisciplinary space for the reflection on man who is the subject of more mainstream scientific knowledge, taken now as an object sitting between these more conventional areas, and of course associating with disciplines such as anthropology, psychology, sociology, and even history. Rejecting the realist view of scientific inquiry, Foucault argued throughout his work that scientific discourse is not simply an objective study of phenomenon, as both natural and social scientists like to believe, but is rather the product of systems of power relations struggling to construct scientific disciplines and knowledge within given societies. With the advances of scientific disciplines, such as psychology and anthropology, the need to separate, categorize, normalize, and institutionalize populations into constructed social identities 
became a staple staple of the sciences. Construction of what we were considered normal and abnormal stigmatized and ostracized groups of people like the mentally ill and sexual and gender minorities. However, some such as Quine do maintain that scientific reality is a con social construct. Physical objects are conceptually imported into the situation as convenient intermediaries, not by definition in terms of experience, but simply as irreducible posits comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. For my part, I do quality physicists believe in physical objects and not in Homer, Homer's gods, and I do consider it a scientific error to believe otherwise, but in point of epistemological footing, the physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conception only as cultural posits. The public backlash of scientists against such views, particularly in the 1990s, became known as the science wars. A major development in recent decades has been the study of the formation, structure, and evolution of scientific communities by sociologists and anthropologists, including David Bohr, Harry Collins, Bruno Latour, Ian Hacking, and Anselm Strauss. Concepts and methods such as rational choice, social choice, and game theory from economics have also been applied for understanding the efficiency of scientific communities in the production of knowledge. This interdisciplinary field has come to be known as science and technology studies. Here, the approach to the philosophy of science is to study how scientific communities actually operate. Continental philosophy. Philosophers of the continental philosophical, philosophical tradition are not traditionally recognized, uh, categorized as philosophers of science. However, they have much to say about science, some of which is anticipated themes in the analytical tradition. For example, in the genealogy of morals, 1887, Frederick Nietzsche advances the thesis that the motive for the search for truth in science is a kind of ascetic ideal. In general, continental philosophy views science from a world historical perspective. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel became one of the first philosophers to support this view. Philosophers such as Pierre Duhem and Gatson uh, Bachelard also wrote their works with this world historical approach to science predating Kuhn's 1962 work by a generation or more. All of these approaches involve a historical and sociological turn to science with a priori priority on lived experience, a kind of her Herselian life world, rather than a progress-based or anti-historical approach as emphasized in the analytical tradition. One can trace the continental strand of thought through the phenomenology of Edmund Herschel, the late works of Merle Ponte, and the hermeneutics of Martin Heidegger. The largest effect on the continental tradition with respect to science came from Martin Heidegger's critique of the theoretical attitude in general, which of course includes the scientific attitude. For this reason, the continental tradition has remained much more skeptical of the importance of science in human life and in philosophical inquiry. Nonetheless, there has been a number of important works, especially those of the Kuhnian precursor, Alexander Coire. Another important development was that of Michael Michel Foucault's analysis of historical and scientific thought in the order of things, 1966, and his study of power and corruption within the science of madness. Post-Heideggerian authors contributing to continental philosophy of the science in the second half of the 20th century include the Frankfurt School of Gurgen Habermas, Truth and Justification, Karl Friedrich, uh, and Wolfgang Stegmuller. Reductionism. Analysis involves breaking an observation or theory down to simpler concepts in order to understand it. Reductionism can refer to one of several philosophical positions related to this approach. One type of reductionism suggests that phenomenon are amenable to scientific explanation. At lower levels of analysis and inquiry, perhaps a historical event might be explained in sociological and psychological terms, which in turn might be described in terms of human physiology, which in turn might be described in terms of chemistry and physics. Daniel Dennett distinguishes between legitimate reductionism from what he calls greedy reductionism, which denies real complexities and leaps too quickly to sweeping generalization. Then uh, there's the philosophy of the subtopics, topics, philosophy of physics, mathematics, chemistry, and so on. And so there you have it. That's just the basic overview from Wikipedia.
of the philosophy of science. So that's, you're really just a precursor of what I'm going to do because I have articles and thoughts on almost all of those topics and many of the names that were mentioned just in that small section. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm hopefully going to dive extremely deep into Leibniz, uh, Descartes, Newton, the foundation uh, you, the of calculus, the mathematic uh, nature of scientific laws, and metaphysical assumptions. Um, so the philosophy of science is partially based on metaphysical assumptions, but it's also trying to divorce science from its metaphysical assumptions. So you have multiple truth hypotheses. You could see just within any small field, philosophy of science, even with one of these schools, like I mentioned, log logical positivism, continental philosophy, or reductionism, any one of these schools has multiple models and theories and theoreticians that... Uh, Hopefully, we'll see how the multiple truth hypothesis will help to navigating it. So as of now, I'm not part of any school or another. You assume that there's multiple truths. There's some level of truth to all of these schools and theories. And so to say, in order to understand truth, you have to be able to navigate the multiple truths. So let's look at the historiography of science because it's another important topic that I plan on going in depth is to the history of science. And so you need the historiography of, of uh, the history of science. The historiography of science or the historiography of the history of science is the study of the history and methodology of the subdiscipline of history known as the history of science, including its disciplinary aspect and practices, methods, theory, schools, and the study of its own historical development. Historiographical debates regarding the proper method for the study of the history of science are sometimes difficult to demarcate from the historical controversies regarding the course of science. Early controversies in the latter kind are considered to be by some of the to be the inception of the subdiscipline. And so I I'll probably do two or three episodes, maybe even four or five, just on the philosophy of science, and then I'll probably pivot into the history of science and examine uh, you know, some of uh, the, ma the major epochs or revolutions that we'll talk about more in terms of what is a scientific revolution and the examples. So today I'm talking more pure theory and not giving any you know, real examples of uh, you know, the actual science. Histories of science were originally written by practicing and retired scientists. A notable early example being William Wewell's History of the Inductive Sciences. And I think Wewell is actually the person who coined the term scientist. Biographies of natural philosophers, early scientists, were also popular in the 19th century, helping to create Isaac Newton as a scientific genius and national hero in Great Britain. H.G. Wells began to trend for histories of science on a grand scale, a kind of epic of civilization and progress with his outline of history, 1919 to 20. Popular accounts of science past were often linked to speculations about its future with science fiction, fiction writers such as Isaac Asimov and L. Sprague de Camp dabbling in the two. Professional historiography of science. Internalism and externalism. In the early 1930s, a paper given by the Soviet historian Born Hessen prompted many historians to look at the ways in which scientific practices were allied with the needs and motivation of their context. Hessen's work focused on social political factors in what science is done and how. The method of doing history of science that became known as externalism looks at the manner in which science and scientists are affected and guided by their context and the world in which they exist. It is an approach which eschews the notion that the history of science is the development of pure thought over time, one idea leading to another in a contextual bubble which could exist in any place at any time if only given the right geniuses. The method of doing history of science, which preceded externalism, became known as internalism. Internalist histories of science often focused on the rational reconstruction of scientific ideas and consider the development of these ideas wholly within the scientific world. 
Although internalist histories of modern science tend to emphasize the norms of modern science, internalist histories can also consider the different science systems of thought underlying the development of Babylonian astronomy and medieval impetus theory. Few historians then or now would insist that either of these approaches in their extremes paint a wholly complete picture, nor would it necessarily be possible to practice one fully over the other. However, at the heart, they contained a basic question about the nature of science. What is the relationship between the producers and the consumers of scientific knowledge? The answer to this question must, in some form, inform the method in which the history of science and technology is conducted. Conversely, how the history of science and technology is conducted and what it concludes can inform the answer to the question. The question itself contains an entire host of philosophical questions. What is the nature of scientific truth? What does objectivity mean in scientific context? How does change in scientific theories occur? The historian sociologist of science, Robert K. Merton, produced many works following Hessen's, Hessen's thesis, which can be seen as reactions to and refinements of Hessen's argument. In his work on science, technology, and society in the 17th century England, Merton sought to introduce an additional category, Puritanism, to explain the growth of science in this period. Merton split Hessen's, Hessen's category of economics into smaller subcategories of influence, including transportation, mining, and military technique. Merton also tried to develop empirical, quantitative approaches to showing the influence of external factors of science. Even with his emphasis on external factors, Merton differed from Hessen in his interpretation. Merton maintained that while researchers may be inspired and interested by problems which were suggested by extra scientific factors, ultimately the researchers' interests were driven by the internal history of the science in question. Merton attempted to delineate externalism and internalism along disciplinary boundaries with context studied by the sociologists of science and contact contend by the historian. So when I went over my um, review of the Royal Society and Newton and the role of Freemasonry, <coughs> that's probably the, like a golden medium me of uh, the internalist and externalist. So I like to look at both factors of what was known beforehand, how the ideas are building off previous ideas just purely within the realm of ideas, but then there's also the cultural, historical, economic uh, factors uh, of the scientist in the time that they lived. Like you said, that uh, science was propelled forward by a relatively small group of people within Europe in few periods of time. And you know now there might be a global basis to it. And uh, I'll also return to the subject of Freemasonry and the connection of Freemasonry to the development of science, because for a 300 year period, possibly even through today, um, but you know certainly for 250 years, almost all of the major advancements in science were done by Freemasons. And that uh, you know goes into the Freemasonry as a method to control the internal and external factor and also relating to technology and engineering in terms of the internal progression of ideas and advancement of ideas one generation to the next, while at the same time meeting the needs of the current society we live in and also factors like funding and uh, you know, low birth and high birth, people with talent for ideas uh, versus like the Royal Society, people with resources or necessity in running of society. Historiographical approaches to theory change in science. A major subject of concern and controversy to the philosophy of science has been the nature of paradigm shift or theory change in science. Karl Popper argued that scientific knowledge is progressive and cumulative. Thomas Kuhn, that scientific knowledge moves through paradigm shift and is not necessarily progressive. And Paul Feyerbend, that scientific knowledge is not cumulative or progressive and there can be no demarcation in terms of method between science and any form of investigation. In 1935, Ludwig Fleck, a Polish medical microbiologist, published Genesis and Development of Scientific Fact. Fleck's book focused on the epistemological and linguistic factors that affect scientific discovery involving and progress or development. 
it used a case study in the field of medicine, uh, syphilis, to present the thesis about the social nature of knowledge, in particular science and scientific thought styles, which are the epistemological, conceptual, and linguistic styles of scientific but also non-scientific thought collectives. Flexbook suggests that epistemologically, there's nothing stable or realistically true or false about any scientific fact. A fact has a genesis, which is grounded in certain theoretical grounds and many times other obscure and fuzzy notions, and it develops as it is subject to dispute and additional research by other scientists. Flex monograph was published at almost the same time as Karl Popper's uh, Logic uh, der Forschung, but unlike Popper's work, the book received no reviews. However, Thomas Kuhn acknowledged the influence it had upon the structure of scientific revolution. Kuhn also wrote the foreword to Flex English translation. Falsibility. Popper coined the term critical rationalism to describe his philosophy. He distinguished between verification and falsibility and said that a theory should be considered scientific if and only if it is falsifiable. Popper sought to explain the apparent progress of scientific knowledge in all life as problem solving. Popper suggested that our understanding of the universe seems to improve over time because of evolutionary process. He proposes that the process of error elimination in the field of science is like the natural selection for biological evolution, whereby theories that better survive the process of refutation are not necessarily more true, but more fit or applicable to the problem situation at hand. Popper suggested that the evolution of theories through the scientific method could reflect a certain type of progress towards more and more interesting problems. Popper helped to establish the philosophy of science as an autonomous discipline within philosophy through his own prolific and influential works and also through his influence on his own contemporaries and students. <coughs> Revolutions. The mid 20th century saw a series of studies investigating the roles of science and social context. The sociolo sociology of science focused on the ways in which scientists work, looking closely at the ways in which they produce and construct scientific knowledge. Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962, is considered particularly influential. It opened the study of science to new disciplines by suggesting that the evolution of science was in part sociologically determined and that positivism did not explain the actual interactions and strategies of the human participants in science. As Kuhn put it, the history of science may, seen, may be seen in more nuanced terms, such as that of competing paradigms or conceptual systems in a wider matrix that includes intellectual, cultural, economic, and political themes outside of science. Partly by selection, partly by distortion, the scientists of earlier ages are implicitly presented as having worked upon the same set of fixed problems and in accordance with the same set of fixed canons that the most recent revolution in scientific theory and method made seem scientific. In 1965, Greg Buchdahl wrote A Revolution in Historiography of Science, referring to the studies of the Thomas Kuhn and Joseph Agassi. He suggested that these two writers have inaugurated a subdiscipline by distinguishing clearly between the history and the historiography of science, and they argued that the historiographical views greatly influenced the writing of the history of science. Further stu studies such as Jerome Ravitz's Scientific Knowledge and its Social Problems, 1971, referred to the role of the scientific community as a social construct construct in accepting or rejecting objective scientific knowledge. Since the 1960s, a common trend in, study, in science studies has been to emphasize the human component of scientific knowledge and to de-emphasize the view that scientific data are self-evident, value-free, and context-free. The field of science and technology studies, an area that overlaps and often informs historical studies of sciences, focuses on the social context and of science in both contemporary and historical periods. Corresponding with the rise of the environmentalist movement and the general loss of optimism of the power of science and technology unfettered to solve problems of the world, this new history encouraged many critics to pronounce the preeminence of science to be overthrown. Science wars. The science wars of the 1990s were about the influence of especially French philosophers, which denied the objectivity of science in general or seemed to do so. They described as well differences between the idealized model of a pure science and the actual scientific practice, while scientism, a revival of the positivism approach, saw in precise measurement and rigorous calculation the basis 
for finally settling enduring metaphysical and moral controversies. And finally, Eurocentrism in the historiography of science. Eurocentrism is in scientific history, our historical accounts written about the development of modern sciences that attribute all scholarly, technological, and philosophical gains to Europe and marginalize outside contributions until Joseph Needham's book series Science and Civilization in China began in 1954. Many historians would write about modern science solely as a European achievement with no significant contributions from civilizations other than the Greeks. Recent historical writings have argued that there was a significant influence and contribution from Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Arabic, Indian, and Chinese astronomy and mathematics. The employment of notions of cross-cultural exchange and the study of the history of science helps in putting the discipline on a path towards being a non Eurocentric and nonlinear field of study. Okay, so this is another topic that I plan on going in depth into the history of science. And so we have to go the historiography of the history of science and the various schools to interpret the history of science within. And, uh, you know, so I'm just reading through this now. Hopefully it has a little educational use for people listening and to clarify my own thoughts moving forward. So I figure I just start with these uh, Wikipedias to put out there some of the basic information and schools of topics that I'll be going more in depth into. History of the scientific method. So obviously the modern usage of the term science is usually in reference to the scientific method. And science is what is done within the methods of science. And for that, we need the history of the scientific method. The history of the scientific method considers changes in the methodology of scientific inquiry as distinct from the history of science itself. The development of rules for scientific reasoning has not been straightforward scientific method has been the subject of intense and recurring debates throughout the history of science, and eminent natural philosophers and scientists have argued for the primacy of one or another approach to establishing scientific knowledge. Despite the disagreement about approaches, scientific methods has advanced in definite steps. Rationalist explanations of nature, including atomism, appeared both in ancient Greece and in the thought of Leucippus and Democritus, and in ancient Indian, the Nyaya in the Vaisheka, Vaisheka and Buddhist schools where Charvaka materialism rejected inference as a source of knowledge in favor of an empiricism that was always subject to doubt. Aristotle, Aristotle pioneered the method in ancient Greece alongside his empirical biology and his work on logic, rejecting a purely deductive framework in favor of generalizations made from observations of nature. Some of the most important debates in the history of scientific method center on rationalism, especially as advocated by Rene Descartes, inductivism, uh, which rose to particular prominence with Isaac Newton and his followers, and the hypothetical deductivism, which came to the fore in the early 19th century. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the debate over realism versus anti-realism was central to the discussions of scientific method as powerful scientific theories extended beyond the realm of the observable, while in the mid-20th century, some prominent philosophers argued against any universal rules of science at all. So early Babylonians and Egyptians developed much technical knowledge, crafts, and mathematics used in practical tasks of divination, as well as knowledge of medicine, and made lists of various kinds, while Babylonians in particular had engaged in the earliest forms of empirical mathematical sciences, uh, with their early attempts at mathematically describing natural phenomenon, they generally lacked an underlying rational theories of nature. Classical antiquity. Greek-speaking ancient philosophers engaged in the earliest known form of what today is recognized as the rational theoretical science. Uh, with the mo move forward towards a ra more rational understanding of nature, which began at least since the archaic period of 650 to 480 BCE with the pre-Socratic school, Thales was the first known philosopher to use natural explanations, proclaiming that every event had a natural cause, even though he was known for saying, all things are full of gods and sacrificed an ox when he discovered his theorem. Leucippus went on to develop the theory of atomism, 
the idea that everything composed entirely into various imperishable, indivisible elements called atoms. This was elaborated in great detail by Democritus. Similar atomist ideas emerged independently among ancient Indian philosophers in the Naya of Vaishika and Buddhist schools, in particular the Nyaya of Vaishika, Vai, Vai, Vaisasika and Buddhist schools, the Charvaka epistemology was materialist and skeptical enough to admit perception as the basis for unconditionally true knowledge, while cautioning that if one could only infer a truth, then one must also harbor a doubt about that truth, and inferred truth could not be unconditional. Toward the middle of 5th century BC, some of the components of the scientific tradition were already heavily established, even before Plato, who was an important contributor to the emerging tradition, thanks to the development of deductive reasoning as propounded by a student Aristotle. In Protagoras, Plato mentioned the teaching of arithmetic, astronomy, and geometry in schools. The philosophical ideas of his this time were mostly freed from the constraints of everyday phenomenon and common sense. The denial of reality as we experience it reached an extreme in Paramides, who argued that the world was one and that change and subdivisions do not exist. In the third and fourth century BC, the Greek history physicist, uh, physicians, Herophilus and Aristratus of Chios, employed experiments to further their medical research. Aristratus at one time repeatedly weighed a caged bird and noticed its weight loss between feeding times. Aristotle. Aristotle's inductive deductive method used inductions from observation to infer general principles, deductions from those principles to check against further observation, and more cycles of induction and deduction to continue the advancement of knowledge. The organon, meaning instrument, tool, organ, is the standard collection of Aristotle's six works on logic. The organon was given by Aristotle's followers, the peripatetics. The order of the works is not chronological, um, but was deliberately chosen by Theophrastus to constitute a well-structured system. Indeed, part of this system, parts of this seem to be a scheme of lecture on logic. The arrangements of the work was made by Andronicus of Rhodes around 40 BCE. The organon comprises the following six sections. The categories introduces Aristotle's tenfold classification of that which exists, substance, quant quantity, quality, relation, place, time, situation, condition, action, and passion on interpretation, introduces Aristotle's conception of proposition and judgment and the various relations between affirmative, negative, universal, and particular propositions. Aristotle discusses the square of opposition or square of Apuleius in, chap in chapter seven and its appendix to chapter eight. Chapter nine deals with the problem of future contingents. The prior analytics introduce an introduces Aristotle's syllogism, syllogistic method, argues for its correctness, and discusses inductive inference. The posterior analytics deals with demonstration, definition, and scientific knowledge. The topics treats the issues in constructing valid arguments and of inference that is probable rather than certain. It is in this treatise that Aristotle mentions the predictables later discussed by Porphyry, and the scholastic logicians. In the sophistical refutations, Gibbs' treatment of the logical fallacies and provides a key link to Aristotle's work on rhetoric. Aristotle's metaphysics has some points of overlap with his works making up the organon, but is not traditionally considered part of it. Additionally, their works on logic attributed with varying degrees of plausibility to Aristotle that were not known to the peripatetics. Aristotle has been called the founder of modern science by uh, De Lacy O'Leary. He demonstrated his demonstrated demonstration method is found in posterior analytics. He provided another of the ingredients of scientific tradition empiricism. For Aristotle, universal truths can be known from particular things via induction. To some extent, then Aristotle reconciles abstract thought with observation although it would be a mistake to imply that Aristotelian science is empirical in form. Indeed, Aristotle did not accept that knowledge acquired by induction could rightly be counted as scientific knowledge. Nevertheless, induction was for him a necessary preliminary to the main business of scientific inquiry, providing the preliminary premises required for scientific demonstration. Aristotle largely ignored 
inductive reasoning in his treatment of scientific inquiry to make clear why this is so considered the statement in posterior analytics. We suppose ourselves to possess unqualified scientific knowledge of a thing as opposed to knowing it in the accidental way in which the sophists know when we think that we know the cause on which the fact depends as the cause of the fact and of no other and further that the fact could know could not be other than it is. It is therefore the work of the philosophers to demonstrate universal truths and discover their causes. While induction was sufficient for discovering universals by generalizations, it did not succeed in identifying causes. For this task, Aristotle used the tool of deductive reasoning in the form of syllogisms. Using the syllogism, scientists could infer new universal truths from those already established. Aristotle developed a complete normative approach to scientific inquiry involving the syllogism, which he discussed at length in his posterior analytics. The difficulty of this scheme lay in showing that derived truths have solid primary premises. Aristotle would not allow that demonstrations could be circular, supporting the conclusion by the premises and the premises by the conclusion, nor would he allow an infinite number of middle terms between the primary premises and the conclusion. This leads to the question of how the primary premises are found or developed, and as mentioned above, Aristotle file allowed that induction would be required for this task. Towards the end of posterior analytics, Aristotle discusses knowledge by imparted by induction. Thus it is clear we must get to know the primary premises by induction for the method by which even sense perception implants the universal is inductive. It follows that there will be no scientific knowledge of the primary premises and since except intuition, nothing can be truer than scientific knowledge. It will be intuition that apprehends the primary premises. If therefore it is the only other kind of true thinking except scientific knowing, intuition will be the originative source of scientific knowledge. This account leaves room for doubt regarding the nature extent of Aristotle's empiricism. In particular, it seems that Aristotle considers sense perception only as a vehicle for knowledge through intuition. He restricted his investigations in natural history to their natural setting. Aristotle and Theophrastus together formulated the new science of biology inductively case by case for two years before Alexander was Aristotle was called to tutor Alexander the Great. Aristotle performed no modern style experiments in the form in which they appear in today's physics and chemistry laboratories. Induction was not afforded, afforded the status of scientific reasoning, and so was left to intuition to provide a solid foundation for Aristotle's science. What is said, Aristotle brings us somewhat closer to an empirical science than his predecessors. Epicurus. Hey, Chicago, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Pajero, thanks for tuning in. Been a while. Epicurus. In his work, uh, Canon, a straight edge or ruler, thus any type of measure or standard refers to a canonic. Epicurus laid out his first rule for inquiry in physics that is, the first concepts be seen and that they not require demonstration. His second rule for inquiry was that the prior to an investigation, we are to have self-evident concepts so that we might infer both what is expected and also what is not apparent. Epicurus applies his method of inference, the use of observations as signs, the method of using the phenomenon as signs of what is unobserved, immediately to the atomic theory of Democritus. In Aristotle's prior analytics, Aristotle himself employs the use of signs, but Epicurus presented his canonic as a rival to Aristotle's logic. Emergence of inductive experimental method. So, God forbid, from the period of the Greeks and a little bit of the Islamic Golden Age, uh, really till the Renaissance. So, uh, you know, a lot of these times when I talk about uh, you know the due diligence of the history of ideas, you have the Greeks, and then sometimes you have a two thousand year break uh, till the next relevant advancements. Emergence of the inductive experimental method. During the Middle Ages, issues on what is now termed science began to be addressed. There was greater emphasis on combining theory with practice in the Islamic world than there had been in classical times. And it was common for those studying the sciences to be artisans as well, something that had been considered an aberration in the ancient world. Islamic experts in the sciences were often expert instrument makers 
who enhanced their powers of observation and calculation with them. Starting in the early 9th century, early Muslim scientists such as Al-Kindi, 801-873, and the authors writing under the name of Jabir Ibn Hayyan, 850-950, started to put a greater emphasis on the use of experiment as a source of knowledge. Several scientific methods thus emerged from the medieval Muslim world by the early 11th century, all of which emphasized experimentation as well as quantification to varying degrees. The Arab physicist Ibn al-Hathiyam used experimentation to obtain the results in his book of optics, 1021. He combined observations, experiments, and rational arguments to support his intromission theory of vision in which rays of lights are emitted from objects rather than from the eyes. He used similar arguments to show that the ancient emission theory of vision supported by Ptolemy and Euclid in which the eyes emit the rays of light used for seeing and the ancient intromission theory supported by Aristotle where objects emit physical particles to the eyes were both wrong. Experimental evidence supported most of the propositions in his book of optics and grounded his theories of vision, light, and color as well as his research into uh, catoptrics and dioptrics. His legacy was elaborated through the reforming of his optics by Kamal al-Din al-Farsi, 1320, and the latter's Katib, the revision of optics. Al-Azin views scientific study as search for truth. Truth is sought for its own sake, and those who are engaged upon the quest for anything for its own sake are not interested in other things. Finding the truth is difficult, and the road to it is rough. al work included the conjecture that light travels through transparent bodies in straight lines on only, which he was able to corroborate only after years of effort. He stated, this is clearly observed in the lights which enter into dark rooms through holes. The entering light will be clearly observable in the dust which fills the air. He also demonstrated the conjecture by placing a straight stick or a tout thread next to the beam of light. Even the Hathium also employed scientific skepticism and emphasized the role in empiricism. He also explained the role of induction in syllogism and criticized Aristotle for his lack of contribution to the method of induction, which even Alathium regarded as superior to syllogism. And he considered induction to be the basic requirement for true scientific research. Something like Occam's razor is also present in the book of optics. For example, after demonstrating that light is generated by luminous objects and emitted on reflecting into the eyes, he states that therefore, the extra mission of visual rays is superfluous and useless. He may also have been the first scientist to adopt a form of positivism in his approach. He wrote that we do not go beyond experience and we cannot be content to use pure concepts in investigating natural phenomena, and that the understanding of these cannot be acquired without mathematics. After assuming that, after assuming that light is a material substance, he does not further discuss its nature, but confines his investigations to the diffusion of the propagation of light. The only properties of light he takes into account are those treatable by geometry and verifiable by, verifiable by experiment. Al-Biruni, the Persian scientist Abu Rahan al-Biruni, introduced early scientific methods for several different fields of inquiry during the 1020s and 30s. For example, his treatise on mineralogy, a Book of Precious Stones, Al Bruni is the most exact of experimental scientists. While in the introduction to his study of India, he declares that to execute our project, it has not been possible to follow the geometric method and thus became one of the pioneers of comparative sociology in insisting on field experience and information. He also developed an early experimental method for mechanics. Al Bruni's method resembled the modern scientific method, particularly in his emphasis on repeated experimentation. Bruni was convinced, concerned with how to conceptualize and prevent both systematic errors and observational biases, such as errors caused by the use of small instruments and errors made by human observers. He argued that if instruments produce errors because of their imperfections or idiosyncratic qualities, then multiple observations must be taken, analyzed qualitatively on the basis, arrive at a common sense single value for the constant sought whether in arithmetic mean or reliable estimate. In a scientific method, universal came out of practical experimental work and theories are formulated after discoveries as with inductivism. Ibn Sina, in the on demonstration section 
of the Book of Healing, 1027, the Persian philosopher and scientist Ibn Sina discussed philosophy of science and described an early scientific method of inquiry. He discussed Aristotle's posterior analysis, analytics and significantly diverged from it on several points. Ibn Sina discussed the issue of a proper procedure for scientific inquiry and the question, how does one acquire the first principles of a science? He asked how a scientist might find the initial axioms of hypothesis or deductive science without inferring them from some more basic premises. He explained that the ideal situation is when one grasps that a relation holds between two terms, which would allow for absolute universal certainty. Ibn Sina added two further methods for finding the first principle, the ancient Aristotelian method of induction and the more recent method of examination and experimentation. Ibn Sina criticized Aristotelian induction, arguing that it does not lead to the absolute universal and certain premises that it purports to provide. In its place, he advocated a method of experimentation as a means for scientific inquiry. Early in the Canada Medicine, 1025, Ibn Sina was also the first to describe what is essentially methods of agreement, the difference in concomitant variation, which are critical to inductive logic and the scientific method. However, unlike his contemporary Al Bruni scientific method, in which universals came out of practical experimental work and theories are formulated after discoveries, Ibn Sina developed a scientific procedure in which general and universal questions came first and led to experimental work. Due to the differences between their methods, Al Bruni referred to himself as a mathematical scientist and Ibn Sina as a philosopher during a debate between the two scholars. Bravo Grossateste. During the European Renaissance of the 12th century, ideas on scientific methodology, including Aristotle's empiricism and the experimental approaches of Al-Hazm and Ibn Sina, were introduced to medieval Europe via Latin translators of Arabic and Greek texts. Robert uh, Grossateste's commentary on the posterior analytics places Grossateste's among the first scholastic thinkers in Europe to understand Aristotle's vision of the dual nature of scientific reason, concluding from particular observation to universal law and then back again from universal laws to prediction of particulars, Grossateste called this resolution and composition. Further, Grossateste said that both paths should be verified through experimentation to verify the principles. Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon was inspired by the writing of Grotesque in, account, in his account of a method. Bacon describes a repeating cycle of observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and the need for independent verification. He recorded the way he had conducted his experiments in precise detail, perhaps with the idea that others could reproduce and independently test his results. About 1256, he joined the Franciscan order and became subject to the Franciscan statute forbidding friars from publishing books or pamphlets without specific approval. After the accession of Pope Clement IV in 1265, the Pope granted Bacon a special commission to write to him on scientific matters. In 18 months, he completed three large treatises, the Opus uh, Magis, Opus Minus, and the Opus Tertium, which he sent to the Pope. William Wewell has called Opus Magis at once the Encyclopedia and the Organ of the 13th century. Part one treats the four causes of error, authority, custom, the opinion of the unskilled many, and the concealment of real ignorance by pretense of knowledge. Part four treats of experimental science. There are two methods of knowledge, the one by argument and the other by experience. Mere argument is never sufficient. It may decide a question, but gives no satisfactory or certainty to the mind, which can only be convinced by immediate inspection or intuition, which is what experience gives. Experimental science, which is in the opus tertium, is distinguished from the speculative sciences and the operative arts. It is said that there are three great prerogatives over all sciences. It verifies their conclusions by direct experiment. It discovers truth, which they could never reach. It investigates the secrets of nature and opens us to knowledge of the past and future. Roger Bacon illustrates his method by an investigation to the nature of cause of the rainbow and a specimen of inductive research. Renaissance humanism and medicine. Aristotle's ideas became a framework for critical debate beginning with the absorption of the Aristotelian text into the university curriculum in the first half of the 13th century. Contributing to this was the success of medieval theologians 
in reconciling Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology. Within the sciences, medieval philosophers were not afraid of disagreeing with Aristotle on many specific issues, although their disagreements were stated within a language of Aristotelian philosophy. All medieval natural philosophers were Aristotelians, but Aristotelianism had become a somewhat broad and flexible concept. With the end of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance rejection of medieval traditions coupled with an extreme reverence for classical sources led to a recovery of other ancient philosophical traditions, especially the teachings of Plato. By the 17th century, those who clung dogmatically to Aristotle's teachings were faced with several competing approaches to nature. The discoveries of the Americas at the close of the 15th century showed the scholars of Europe that new discoveries could be found outside the authoritative works of Aristotle, Pliny, Galen, and other writers. Galen of Pergamon had studied with four schools in antiquity, Platonists, Aristotelians, Stoics, and Epicureans, and at Alexandria, the center of medicine at, at the time. In his Methodus Mendendi, Galen had synthesized the empirical and dogmatic schools of medicine into his own method, which was preserved by Arab scholars. After the translations from Arabic were critically scrutinized, a backlash occurred and demand arose in Europe for translation of the Galen's medical texts from the original Greek. Galen's method became very popular in Europe. Thomas Nanakre, uh, the teacher of Erasmus, thereupon translated Methodist Mendendi from Greek into Latin for a larger audience in 1590. Limbrick uh, notes that in 630 editions, translations and commentaries on Galen were produced in Europe in the 16th century, eventually eclipsing Arabic medicine there and peaking in 1560 at the time of the scientific revolution. By the late 15th century, the physician scholar Nikolai Leoncino was finding errors in Pliny's natural history. As a physician, Leoncino was concerned with these botanical errors propagating to the material medica on which medicines were based. To counter this, a botanical garden was established at Orto Botanica of Podova, University of Padua, in order that medical students might have empirical access to the plants of pharmacopoeia. Other Renaissance teaching gardens were established, notably by the physician uh, Leonard Fuchs, one of the founders of botany. The first published work devoted to the concept of method is by Jodocius Willichius, 1550. Skepticism as the basis for understanding. In 1562, outlines of Pyrrhonism by the ancient Pyrrhonist philosopher Sectus Empiricus was published in a Latin translation from Greek, quickly placing the arguments of classical skepticism in the European mainstream. These arguments established seemingly insurmountable challenges for the possibility of certain knowledge. Descartes' famous cogito argument is an attempt to overcome skepticism and reestablish the foundation of certainty, but other thinkers responding by revisiting what the search for knowledge, particularly physical knowledge, might be. The first of these philosophers and physicians, Francisco Sanchez, was led by his medical training in Rome, 1571 to 73, to search for a true method of knowing modus siendi, as nothing clearer could be known by the methods of Aristotle and his followers. For example, syllogism fails upon circular reasoning. Aristotle's modal logic was not stated clearly enough for its use in medieval times and remains a research problem to this day. Following the uh, physician Galen's method of medicine, Sanchez listed the methods of judgment and experiments, which are faulty in the wrong hands, and we are left with a bleak statement that nothing is known. This challenge was taken up by Rene Descartes in The Next Generation, uh, but at least Sanchez warns us that we ought to refrain from the method summaries and commentaries of Aristotle if we seek scientific knowledge. In this, he's echoed by Francis Bacon, who was influenced by another prominent exponent of skepticism, Montaigne. Sanchez cites the humanist Joan Luis Vives, who sought a better educational system as well as a statement of human rights as a pathway for improvement of some of the lot of the poor. Sanchez develops his skepticism by means of an intellectual critique of Aristotelianism rather than by an appeal to the history of hum human stupidity and the variety of contrariety of previous theories. Francis Bacon's eliminative induction. Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, entered Trinity College at Cambridge in 1573, 
when he applied himself diligently to the several sciences as then taught and came to the conclusion that the methods employed and the results attained were alike erroneous. He learned to despise the current Aristotelian philosophy. He believed philosophy must be taught its true purpose, and for this purpose, a new method must be devised. With this conception in mind, Bacon left the university. Bacon attempted to describe a rational procedure for establishing causation between phenomena based on induction. Bacon's induction was, however, radically different than that employed by the Aristotelians. As Bacon put it, another form of induction must be devised that has hitherto been employed, and it must be used for proving and discovering not first principles, as they are called only, but also the lesser axioms in the middle and indeed all, for the induction which proceeds by simple enumeration is childish. Bacon's method relied on experimental histories to eliminate alternative theories. Bacon explains how his method is applied in Novum Organum, published in 1620. In an example he gives on the examination of the nature of heat, Bacon creates two tables, the first in which he names tables of essence and presence, enumerating the many various circumstances under which we find heat, and the other table labeled table of deviation or an absence of proximity, he lists circumstances which bear resemblance to those of the first table except for the absence of heat for an analysis of what he calls the natures of the items. In these lists, we are brought to conclusions about the form nature of cause of heat. Those natures which are always present in the first table, but never in the second are deemed to be the cause of heat. The role of experimentation played in this process was twofold. The most laborious job of the scientist would be to gather the fact or history required to create the tables or presence in absence. Such histories would document a mixture of common knowledge and experimental result. Secondly, experiments of light, or as we may say, crucial experiments would be needed to resolve any remaining ambiguities over causes. Bacon showed an uncompromising commitment to experimentation. Despite this, he did not make any great scientific discoveries during his lifetime. This may be because he was not the most able experimenter. It may also be because the hypothesis plays only a small role in Bacon's method compared to modern sciences. Hypothesis and Bacon's method are supposed to emerge during the process of investigation with the help of mathematics and logic. Bacon gave a substantial but secondary role to mathematics, which ought only to give definiteness to natural philosophy, not to generate or give birth to it. An overemphasis on axiomatic reasoning had rendered previous non-empirical philosophy impotent in Bacon's view, which was expressed in his Novum Organum, there are and can only be two ways of searching into the discovering truth. The one flies from the senses and particulars to the most general axioms, and from these principles, the truth of which it takes for settled and immovable proceeds to judgment and the discovery of middle axioms. And this way is now in fashion. The other axioms, the, the other derives axioms from the senses and particulars, rising by gradual and unbroken ascent so that arrives at the most general axioms last of all. This is the true way, but is yet untried. Descartes. In 1619, René Descartes began writing his first major treatise on proper scientific and philosophical thinking, the unfinished rules for the direction of the mind. His aim was to create a complete science that hoped he hoped would overthrow the Aristotelian system and establish himself as the sole architect of a new system of guiding principles for scientific research. This work continued and clarified in his, 19, in his 1637 treatise, Discourse on Method, and his 1641 Meditations. Descartes describes the intriguing and disciplined thought experiments he used to arrive at the idea we instantly associate with him, I think, therefore I am. From this foundational thought, Descartes finds proof of the existence of a God who, possessing all possible perfections, will not deceive him, provided he resolves never to accept anything for true, which I did not clearly know to be such, that is to say, carefully to avoid precipitancy and prejudice and to comprise nothing more in my judgment than what was presented to my mind so clearly and distinctly as to exclude all ground of methodic doubt. The rule allowed Descartes to progress beyond his own thought and judge that there exist extended bodies outside of his own thought. Descartes published seven sets of objections to the meditations from various sources along with his replies to them. Despite his apparent departure from the Aristotelian system, a number of his critics felt that Descartes had done little more than replace the primary premises of Aristotle with those of his own. 
whereas Aristotle purported to arrive at his first principles by induction, Descartes believed that he could obtain them using reason only. In this sense, he was a Platonist and believed that innate ideas as opposed to Aristotle's blank state, a blank slate tabula rasa, and stated that the seeds of science are inside us. Unlike Bacon, Descartes successfully applied his own ideas in practice. He made significant contributions to science, in particular the aberration corrected optics. His work in analytical geometry was a necessary precedent to differential calculus and instrumental in bringing mathematical analysis to bear on scientific matters. Galileo Galilei, during the period of religious conservatism brought about the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, Galileo Galilei unveiled his new science of motion. Neither the contents of Galileo's science nor the methods of study he selected were in keeping with Aristotelian teachings, whereas Aristotle thought that science should be demonstrated from first principles, Galileo had experiments as a research tool. Galileo nevertheless presented his treatise in the form of mathematical demonstrations without reference to experimental results. It is important to understand that this in and itself was a bold and innovative step in terms of scientific method. The usefulness of mathematics in obtaining scientific results was far from obvious. This is because mathematics did not lend itself to the primary pursuit of Aristotelian science, the discovery of causes. Whether it is because Galileo was realistic about the acceptability of presenting experimental results as evidence, or because he himself had doubts about the epistemological status of experimental findings is not known. Nevertheless, it is not in his Latin treatises on motion that we find reference to experiments, but in his supplementary dialogues in the Italian vernacular. In these dialogues, experimental results are given, although Galileo may have found them inadequate for persuading his audience. Thought experiments shown logical contradictions in Aristotelian thinking presented in the skilled rhetoric of Galileo's dialogue were further enticements for the readers. Isaac Newton. Both Bacon and Descartes wanted to write a firm foundation for a scientific thought that avoided the deceptions of the mind and senses. Bacon envisaged that foundation as essentially empirical, where De as Descartes provided a metaphysical foundation for knowledge, if there were any doubts about the direction in which scientific method would develop, they were set to rest by the success of Isaac Newton, implicitly rejecting Descartes' emphasis on rationalism in favor of Bacon's empirical approach. He outlines his four rules of reasoning in the Principica. One, we are to admit no more causes of natural things than such as are both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. Two, therefore, to the same natural effects we must, as far as possible, assign the same causes. Three, the quality of bodies which admit neither intention nor remission of degrees and which are found to belong to all bodies within the reach of our experiments are to be esteemed the universal qualities of all bodies whatsoever. Four, in experimental philosophy, we are to look upon propositions collected by general induction from phenomena as accurately or very nearly true, notwithstanding any contra contrary hypothesis that may be imagined until such a time as other phenomena occur by which they may either be made more accurate or liable to exceptions. But Newton also left an, an admonition about a theory of everything to explain all of nature is too difficult a task for any one man or even for any one age. It is much better to do a little with certainty and leave the rest for others that come after you than to explain all things. Newton's work became a model that other sciences sought to emulate and his inductive approach formed the basis for much of natural philosophy throughout the 18th and 19th century. Some methods of reasoning were later systemized by Mill's method or canon, which are five explicit statements on what can be discarded and what can be kept while building hypotheses. George Bull and William Stanley Jevons also wrote on the principles of reasoning. Integrating deductive and inductive models. Attempts to systemize the scientific method were confronted in the mid 18th century by the problem of induction, a positivistic logical logic formulation in which, in short, asserts that nothing can be known with certainty except what is actually observed. David Hume took empiricism to the skeptical extreme among his positions was that there is no logical necessity that the future should resemble the past, that we are unable to justify inductive reasoning itself, 
by appealing to its past success. Hume's arguments, of course, came on the heels of many, many centuries of excessive speculation upon excessive speculation, not grounded in empirical observation and testing. Many of Hume's radical skeptical arguments were argued against but not resolutely refuted by Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason in the late 18th century. Hume's arguments continued to hold strong lingering influence and certainly on the consciousness of the educated classes for the better part of the 19th century when the argument of the time became the focus of whether or not the inductive method was valid. Hans Christian Orsted was heavily influenced by Kant, in particular Kant's metaphysical foundations of natural science. The following sections on Orsted encapsulate our current common view of scientific method. His work appeared in Danish, most successfully in public lectures, which he translated into German, French, English, and occasionally Latin, but some of his views go beyond Kant. In order to achieve completeness in our knowledge of nature, we must start from two extremes, from experience and from the intellect itself. The former method must conclude with natural laws, which it has abstracted from experience, while the latter must begin with principles, and gradually as it develops more and more, it becomes even more detailed. Of course, I speak here about the method as manifested in the process of the human intellect itself, not as found in textbooks, where the laws of nature which have been abstracted from the consequent experiences are placed first because they require to explain the experiences. When the empiricist, in his regression towards general laws of nature, meets the metaphysician in his progression, science will reach its perfection. Orsted first introduced introduction to general physics, physics 1811 exemplified the steps of observation, hypothesis, deduction, and experiment. In 1805, based on his research on electromagnetism, Orsted came to believe that electricity is propagated by undulatory action fluctuation. By 1820, he felt confident enough in his belief that he resolved to demonstrate them in a public lecture and, in fact, observe a small magnetic effect from a galvanic circuit without rehearsal. In 1831, John Herschel published a preliminary discourse on the study of natural philosophy, setting out the principles of science. Measuring and comparing observation was to be used to find generalizations and empirical laws which describe regularities and phenomena and then natural philosophers were to work towards the higher aim of finding a universal law of nature which explained the causes and effects producing such regularities. An explanatory hypothesis was to be found in evaluating true causes derived from experience. For example, evidence of past climate change could be due to changes in the shape of continents or changes in the Earth orbits. Possible causes could be inferred by analogy to known causes or similar phenomenon. It was essential to evaluate the importance of hypothesis. Our next step in the verification of an induction must therefore consist in extending its application to cases not originally contemplated and studiously varying the circumstances under which our case causes act with a view to ascertain whether their effect is general and in publishing the application of our laws to extreme cases. William Wewell regarded his history of the inductive sciences from the earliest to the present time, 1837, to be an introduction to the philosophy of the inductive sciences, 1840, which analyzed the methods exemplified in the formation of ideas. Wewell attempts to follow Bacon's plan for discovery of an effectual art of discovery. He named the hypothetical deductive method. We will also coined the term scientist. We will examines ideas and attempts to construct science by uniting ideas to fact. He analyzes induction to three steps. One, the selection of a fundamental idea, such as space, number, cause, or likeness. Two, a more special modification of these ideas, such as a circle, uniform force. Three, the determination of magnitudes. Upon these follow special techniques applicable for quantity, such as the method of least squares, curves, means, and special methods depending on resemblance, such as pattern matching, the method of gradation, and the method of natural classification. But no art of discovery, such as Bacon anticipated for invention, sagacity, genius, are needed every step. We well sophisticated concept of science had similarities to shown by Herschel, and he considered that a good hypothesis should connect fields that had previously been thought unrelated, a process he called consilience. However, where Herschel held that the origin of new biological species would be found in a natural rather than a miraculous process, 
we will oppose this and consider that no natural causes has been shown for adaption, so an unknown divine cause was appropriate. John Stuart Mill was stimulated to publish the system of logic in 1843 upon reading Wewell's History of the Inductive Sciences. Mill may be regarded as the final exponent of the empirical school of philosophy begun by John Locke, whose fundamental characteristic is the duty incumbent upon all thinkers to investigate for themselves rather than to accept the authority of others. Knowledge must be based on experience. In the mid-19th century, Claude Bernard was also influential, especially in bringing scientific method to medicine. In his Discourse on Scientific Method, an introduction to the study of experimental medicine, 1865, he described what makes a scientific theory good and what makes a scientist a true discovery. Unlike many scientific writers of his time, Bernard wrote about his own experiments and thoughts and used the first person. William Sandy Jevons, The Principle of Science, A Treatise on Logic and Scientific Method, 1873, uh, Chapter 12, The Inductive or Inverse Method, Summary of the Theory of Inductive Inference States. Thus, there are but three steps in the process of induction. One, framing some hypothesis as to the character of the general law. Two, deducting some consequence of that law. Three, observing whether the consequence agrees with the particular tasks under consideration. Jevons then frames those steps in terms of probability, which then applied to economic laws. Ernst Nagel notes that Jevons and Wewell were not the first writers to argue for the centrality of the hypothetical deductive model in the logic of science. Charles Sanders Pierce. In the late 19th century, Charles Sanders Pierce proposed a schema that would turn out to have considerable influence in the further development of scientific method generally. Pierce's work quickly accelerated the progress on several fronts. Firstly, speaking in broader context on how to make our ideas clear, 1878, Pierce outlined an objectively verifiable method to test the truth of, truth of putative knowledge on a way that goes beyond mere foundational alternatives, focusing upon both deduction and induction. He thus placed induction and deduction in a complementary rather than competitive context, the latter of which had been the primary trend at least since David Hume a century before. Secondly, and more direct importance of, to the scientific method, Pierce put forth the basic schema for hypothesis testing that continues to prevail today. Extracting the theory of inquiry from its raw materials and classical logic, he refined it in parallel with the early development of symbolic logic to address the then current problems of scientific reasoning. Pierce examined and articulated the three fundamental modes of reasoning that play in a scientific theory inquiry today, the processes that are currently known as abductive, deductive, and inductive inference. Thirdly, he played a major role in the progress of symbolic logic itself. Indeed, this was his primary specialty. Charles Pierce was also a pioneer in statistics. Pierce held that science achieves statistical probabilities, not certainties, and that chance of veering from law is very real. He assigned probability to an argument's conclusion rather than to a proposition event uh, as such. Much of his statistical writings promote the frequency interpretation of probability, objective ratios of cases, and many of his writings express skepticism and criticize the use of probability when such models are not based on objective randomization. Though Pierce was largely a frequentist, his possible rural semantics introduced the propensity theory of probability. Pierce investigated the probability judgments of experimental subjects, pioneering decision analysis. Pierce was also one of the founders of statistics. He formulated modern statistics in illustrations of the logic of science, 1877 and 8, and a theory of probable inference, 1883. With a repeated measure design, he introduced blinded, controlled, randomized experiments. He in invented an optimal design for experiments on gravity in which he corrected the means, he used logical regression, correlation, and smoothing, and improved the treatment of outliers. He introduced terms confidence and likelihood. Many of Pierce's ideas were later popularized and developed by Ronald Fisher, Neyman, Ramsey, Bruno, Finetti, and Karl Popper. Modern perspectives. Karl Popper, is generally credited with providing major improvements in the understanding of the scientific method in the mid to late 20th century. In 1934, Popper published The Logic of Scientific Discovery, which repudiated the by then traditional observationist inductivist account of the scientific method. He advocated empirical falsibility as the criterion for distinguishing scientific work from non-science. According to Popper, scientific theory should make predictions, preferably predictions not made from competing theory, 
which can be tested and the theory rejected if these predictions are not shown to be correct. Following Pierce and others, he argued that science would best progress using deductive reasoning as its primary emphasis, known as critical rationalism. His astute formulations on logical procedures helped to rein in the excessive use of inductive speculation upon inductive speculation and also helped to strengthen the conceptual foundation of today's peer review procedures. Ludwig Fleck, a Polish epidemiologist who was a contemporary of Karl Popper, but who influenced Kuhn and others with his genesis and development of scientific fact. Before Fleck, scientific fact was thought to be to spring fully formed when a gestation period is now recognized to be essential before acceptance of a phenomenon as fact. Critics of Popper, chiefly Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerbend, and Imre Lakatos, rejected the idea that there exists a single method that applies to all science and could account for its progress. In, 16, in 1962, Kuhn published the influential book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which suggested science worked within a series of paradigms and argued there was little evidence of scientists actually following a falsification methodology. Kuhn quoted Max Planck, who had said in his autobiography, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. A well-quoted source on the subject of the scientific method and statistical models, George Box wrote, since all models are wrong, the scientist cannot obtain a correct one by excessive elaboration. On the contrary, following William Wackham, he should seek an economical description of natural phenomenon, just the ability to devise but evocative models in the signature of the great scientist. So over elaboration and over parameterization is often the mark of mediocrity. And since all models are wrong, the scientist must alert to what is importantly wrong. It is appropriate, inappropriate to be concerned about mice when there are tigers abroad. These debates clearly show that there's no universal agreement as to what constitutes the scientific method. There remain nonetheless certain core principles that are the foundation of scientific inquiry today. Okay, so glad I read through that. Important details and, you know, I pivot back to the multiple truth hypothesis. It's going to be important, all of these very various schools. So we talked about the historiography of science, of the history of science, um, There was the um, internalism and externalistic views. So you have a basic progression of ideas and then the context which they arose. So just term for the ideas, the very we're going to look in depth and I have uh, a lot of material, um, possibly even some today on, what is a scientific model, what is a scientific theory, and, you know, in-depth modern conceptions of this. But, uh, you know, just wanted to cover, uh, you know, some of the full gamut of the history, and hopefully in the near future, I'll actually go in-depth into many um, area, eras and epochs, and, you know, I, what I'm going to get into is, you know, the revolutions, the important eras where the paradigm of science changed. And the main language that we use is Thomas Kuhn and the Structures of Scientific Revolutions. It said, I already read this book in high school. My dad had it on the shelf, and you know, just the concept of it was fascinating. I think there was a rabbi who wrote a book called Paradigm Shift. Um, and then later, I reread the book. I read quite a bit of material and, you know, like Popper and Kuhn, um, you know, Kuhn might be one of the most dominant names in the philosophy of science, but uh, there's a bunch of them. And, you know, this formulation of scientific revolutions is important. So I thought I would go over um, this in detail. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962, 
is a book about the history of science by philosopher Thomas Kuhn. Its publication was the landmark event in the history of philosophy and sociology of science. Kuhn challenged the then prevailing view of progress in science in which scientific progress was viewed as development by accumulation of accepted facts and theories. Kuhn argued for an episodic model in which periods of conceptual continuity were there in a cumulative process, which Kuhn referred to as periods of normal science were interrupted by periods of revolutionary science. The discovery of anomalies during revolutions in science lead to new paradigms. New paradigms then ask new questions on old data, move beyond the mere puzzle solving of the previous paradigm, change the rules of the game, and map direction, directing new research. So the basic approach. Kuhn's approach to the history and philosophy of science focuses on conceptual issues like the practice of normal science, influence of historical events, emergence of scientific discoveries, nature of scientific revolution, and progress through scientific revolutions. What sort of intellectual options and strategies were available to people during a given period? What type of lexicons and terminology were known and employed during certain epochs? Stressing the importance of not attributing traditional thought to earlier investigators, Kuhn's book argues that the evolution of scientific theory does not emerge from straightforward accumulation of facts, but rather from a set of changing intellectual circumstances and possibilities. Kuhn did not see scientific theories proceeding linearly from an objective, unbiased accumulation of all available data, but rather as a paradigm driven. The operations and measurements the scientist undertakes in the laboratory are not the given of experience, but rather the collective collected with difficulty. They're not what the scientist sees, at least not before his research is well advanced and his attention focused. Rather, they are concrete indices to the content of more elementary perceptions. And as such, they are selected for the close scrutiny of normal research only because they promise opportunity for the fruitful elaboration of an accepted paradigm. Far more clearly than the immediate experience from which in, they in part derive, Operation and measurements are paradigm determined. Science does not deal in all possible laboratory manipulations. Instead, it selects those relevant to the juxtaposition of the paradigm with the immediate experiments that the paradigm has partially determined. As a result, scientists with different paradigms engage in different concrete laboratory manipulations. Coherence. One of the aims of science is to find models that will account for as many observations as possible within a coherent framework. Together, Galileo, rethinking of the nature of motion of the Keplerian cosmology represented a coherent framework that was capable of uh, rivaling the Aristotelian Ptolemaic framework. Once a paradigm shift has taken place, the textbooks are rewritten. Often the history of science too is rewritten, being presented as an inevitable process leading up to the current established framework of thought. There's a prevalent belief that all hitherto unexplained phenomenon will in due course be accounted for in terms of the established framework. Kuhn states that scientists spend most, if not all, of their careers in a process of puzzle solving. Their puzzle solving is pursued with great tenacity because the previous successes of the established paradigm tend to generate great confidence that the approach being taken guarantees that a solution to the puzzle exists, even though it may be hard to find. Kuhn calls this process normal science. As a paradigm is stretched to its limits, anomalies, failures, failures of the current paradigm to take into account observed phenomena accumulate. Their significance is judged by the practitioners of the discipline. Some anomalies may be dismissed as errors in observation. Others as merely requiring small adjustments to the current paradigm that will be clarified in due course. Some anomalies, anomalies resolve themselves spontaneously, having increased the available depth insight along the way. But no matter how great or numerous the anomalies that persist, Kuhn observes that practicing scientists will not lose faith in their established paradigm until a credible alternative is available. To lose faith in the solvability of the problems would in effect mean ceasing to be a scientist. In any community of scientists, Kuhn states that there are individuals who are bolder than most. These scientists, judging that a crisis exists, embark on what Kuhn calls revolutionary scientists, science, exploring alternatives to long-held obvious seeming assumptions. Occasionally this generates a rival to the established framework of thought. The new candidate paradigm will appear to be accompanied by numerous anomalies, partly because it is still so new and incomplete. The majority of the scientific community will oppose any conceptual change and Kuhn emphasizes so they should. To fulfill its potential, 
the scientific community needs to contain both individuals who are bold and individuals who are conservative. There are many examples in the history of science in which confidence in the established frame of thought was eventually vindicated. It is almost impossible to predict whether the anomalies, anomalies is a candidate for a new paradigm will eventually be resolved. The scientists who possess an exceptional ability to recognize a theory's potential will be the first whose preference is likely to shift in favor of the challenging paradigm. The, there typically follows a period in which there are adherence to, of both paradigms. And this time, if the challenging paradigm is solidified and unified, it will replace the old paradigm and a paradigm shift will have occurred. Phases. Kuhn explains the process of scientific change as the result of various phases of paradigm change. Phase one, it exists only once and is the pre-paradigm phase in which there's no consensus on any particular theory. This phase is characterized by several incompatible and incomplete theories. Consequently, most scientific inquiries takes the form of lengthy books and there's no common body of facts that may be taken for granted. If the actors in the pre-paradigm community eventually gravitate to one of these conceptual frameworks and ultimately to a widespread consensus of the appropriate choice of methods, terminology, and on the kinds of experiment that is likely to contribute to increased insight. So Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis will function mostly in this pre-paradigm phase, but at any, any level would be useful, but we see we have multiple conflicting theories. Phase two, normal science begins in which puzzles are solved within the context of the dominant paradigm. As long as there's consensus within the discipline, normal science continues. Over time, progress in normal science may reveal anomalies, facts that are difficult to explain with the context of the existing paradigm. Well, usually these anomalies are resolved, and in some cases they may accumulate to the point where normal science becomes difficult and where weakness in the old paradigm are revealed. Phase three. If the paradigm proves chronically unable to account for anomalies, the community enters a crisis period. Crises are often resolved within the context of normal science. However, after significant efforts of normal science within a paradigm fail, science may enter the next phase. Phase four, paradigm shift or scientific revolution, is the phase in which the underlying assumptions of the field are re-examined and a new paradigm is established. And post Phase five, post-revolution. The new paradigm's dominance is established, and so scientists return to normal science, solving puzzles within the new paradigm. The science may go through these changes repeatedly. Locum notes that it's a good thing for science to do such shifts do not occur often or easily. Incommensurability. According to Kuhn, the scientific paradigms preceding and succeeding a paradigm shift are so different that their theories are incommensurable. The new paradigm cannot be proven or disproven by the rules of the old paradigm and vice versa. Later interpretation by Kuhn of commensurable versus incommensurable was as distinctions between languages, namely that statements in commensurable languages were translatable fully from one to the other, while in incommensurable languages, strict translation is not possible. The paradigm shift does not merely involve the revision or transformation of an individual theory. It changes the way terminology is defined how the scientists in that field view their subject, and perhaps most significantly, what questions are regarded as valid and what rules are used to determine the truth of a particular theory. New theories were not, as the scientist has previously thought, just extensions of old theories, but were instead completely new world views. Such incommensurability exists not just before and after a paradigm shift, but in the period between conflicting paradigms. It is simply not possible, according to Kuhn, to construct an impartial language that can be used to perform a neutral comparison between conflicting paradigms, because the very terms used are integral to the respective paradigms and therefore have different connotations in each paradigm. The advocates of mutually exclusive paradigms are in a difficult posi position. Though each may hope to convert the other to his way of seeing science and its problems, neither may hope to prove his case. The competition between paradigms is not the sort of battle that can be resolved by proofs. Scientists subscribing to different paradigms end up talking past one another. Kuhn states that the probabilistic tools used by verificationists are inherently inadequate for the task of deciding between conflicting theories, since they belong to the very paradigms they seek to compare. Similar observations that are intended to falsify a statement will fall under 
one of the paradigms they are supposed to help compare and will therefore also be inadequate for the task. According to Kuhn, the concept of falsifiability is unhelpful for understanding why and how science has developed as it has. In the practice of science, scientists will only consider the possibility that the theory has been falsified if an alternative theory is available that they can judge credibly. If there is not, scientists will continue to adhere to the established conceptual framework. If a paradigm shift has occurred, the textbooks will be rewritten to state that the previous theory has been falsified. Kuhn further developed his ideas regarding incommensurability in the 1980s and 90s. In his unpublished manuscript in the plurality of worlds, Kuhn introduces the theory of kinds of kind concepts, sets of interrelated concepts that are characteristics of time period in a science and differ in structure from the modern anal analogous kind concepts. These different structures imply different taxonomies of things and processes, and this difference in taxonomies consistence in commensurability. This theory is strongly naturalistic and draws developmental psychology to found a quasi-transcendental theory of experience and reality. Exemplar. Kuhn introduced the concept of exemplar in the postscript of the second edition of the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1970. He noted that he was substituting the term exemplars for paradigm, meaning that problems and solutions that students of a subject learn from the beginning of their education. According to Kuhn, scientific practice alternates between periods of normal science and revolutionary science. During periods of normalcy, scientists tend to subscribe to a large body of interconnecting knowledge, methods, and assumptions, which make the reigning, make up the reigning paradigm. Normal science presents a series of problems that are solved as scientists explore their field. The solutions to some of these problems have become well known and are the exemplars of the field. Those who study scientific discipline are expected to know its exemplars. Kuhn on scientific process, progress. The first edition of Structure of Scientific Revolutions ended with a chapter titled Progress Through Revolutions in which Kuhn spelled out his view on the nature of scientific progress. Since he considered problem solving to be a central element, Kuhn saw that for a new candidate paradigm to be accepted by a scientific community, first the new candidate must seem to resolve some outstanding and generally recognized problem that can be met in no other way. Second, the new paradigm must promise to preserve a relatively large part of the concrete problem solving ability that has accrued to science through its predecessors. While the new paradigm is rarely as expansive as the old paradigm in its initial stages, it must nevertheless have significant promise for future problem solving. As a result, though new paradigms seldom or never possess all the capabilities of their predecessors, they usually preserve a great deal of the most concrete parts of past achievement, and they always permit additional concrete problem solution uh, besides. In the second edition, Kuhn added a postscript in which he elaborated his ideas on the nature of scientific progress. He described a thought experiment involving an observer who was has the opportunity to inspect an assortment of theories, each corresponding to a single stage in a succession of theories. What if the observer is presented with these theories without any explicit indication of their chronological order? Kuhn anticipates that it would be possible to reconstruct their chronological chronology on the basis of the theory scope and content. Because the more recent a theory is, the better it will be as an instrument for solving the kinds of puzzles that scientists aim to solve. Kuhn remarked this is not a relativist position and it displays the sense in which I am convinced believer in scientific progress. Criticisms. Structure of scientific revolutions was soon criticized by Kuhn's colleagues in the history of science, the philosophy of science in 1865, a special symposium on the book was held at the International Colloquium of Philosophy of Science that took place at Bedford College, London, it was chaired by Karl Popper. The symposium led to the publication of the symposium's presentation, plus other essays, most of them critical, which eventually appeared in, in an influential volume of essays. Kuhn expressed the opinion that his critics' readings of the book were so inconsistent with his own understanding of it that he was tempted to posit the existence of two Thomas Kuhns, one of the author of the book and the other of the individual who had been criticized in the symposium by Professor Popper, Feyerman, Lakatos, Tolman, and Watkins. A number of the included essays question the existence of a normal science. In his essay, Feyerman suggests that Kuhn's conception of normal science fits organized crime as well as it does science. Popper expresses distaste with the entire premise of Kuhn's book, writing the idea of turning 
for enlightenment concerning the aims of science and its possible progress to sociology or psychology or to the history of science is surprising and disappointing. Concept of paradigm. Stephen Tomlin defined a paradigm as the set of common beliefs and agreements shared between scientists and how problems should be understood and addressed. In his 1972 work, Human Understanding, he argued that a more realistic picture of science that than that presented in the structure of scientific revolutions would admit the fact that revisions in science take place much more frequently and are much less dramatic than can be explained by the model of revolution normal science. In Tolman's view, such revisions occur quite often during periods of which Kuhn would call normal science. For Kuhn to explain such revisions in terms of the non paradigmatic puzzle solution of normal science, he would need to delineate what in, is perhaps the implausibly sharp distinction between paradigmatic and non paradigmatic science. Incommensurability of paradigms. In a series of texts published in the early 1970s, Carl Kordinick asserted a position somewhere between that of Kuhn and the older philosophy of science. He criticized the Kuhnian position was that the incommensurability thesis was too radical and that this made it impossible to explain the confrontation of scientific theories that actually occurs. According to Kordig, it is in fact possible to admit the existence of revolutions and paradigm shifts in science while still recognizing that theories belong to a different paradigms can be compared and controlled on the plane of observation. Those who accept the incommensurability thesis do not so because they admit the discontinuity of paradigms, but because they attribute a radical change in meaning to such shifts. Kordig maintains that there is a common observational plane. Rival scientific theories share some observations and therefore some meanings. Kordig suggests that this, with this approach, he is not reintroducing the distinctions between observations and theory in which the former is assigned a privileged and neutral status, but that it is possible to affirm more simply the fact that even if no sharp distinction exists between theory and observation, this does not imply that there is no comprehensible difference at the two extremes of this polarity. At a secondary level for Kordig, there is a common plane of inter-paradigmatic standards or shared norms that permit the effective confrontation of rival theories. In, 1870, in 1973, Hardy Field published an article that also sharply criticized Kuhn's idea of incommensurability. Field takes this idea of incommensurability between the same terms in different theories one step further. Instead of attempting to identify the persistence of the reference in terms of different theories, Field's analysis emphasizes the interdeterminacy of reference within the individual theories. Field takes the example of the term mass and ask what exactly mass means in a mo modern post-relativistic physics. He finds that there are at least two different definitions. Relativistic mass, the mass of a particle equal to the total energy of the particle divided by the speed of light squared. Since the total energy of a particle in relation to one system of reference differs from the total energy in relation to other systems of reference, while the speed of light remains constant in all systems, it follows that the mass of a particle has different values in different systems of reference. Real mass, the mass of a particle is equal to the non-kinetic energy of a particle divided by the speed of light squared, since non-kinetic energy is the same in all systems of reference and the same is true of light, it follows that the mass of a particle is the same value in all systems of reference. Projecting its distinction backwards, in time onto Newtonian dynamics, we can formulate the following two hypotheses. Um, the term mass in Newtonian theory denotes relativistic mass, and the term mass in Newtonian theory denotes real mass. According to Field, it is impossible to decide which of these two affirmations is true. Prior to the theory of relativity, the term mass was referentially indeterminate, but this does not mean that the term mass did not have a different meaning than it now has. The problem is not one of meaning, but of reference. The reference of such terms as mass is only partially determined. We do not really know how Newton intended his use of this term to be applied. As a consequence, neither of the two terms fully denotes. It follows that it is improper to maintain that a term is changed in reference during a scientific revolution. It is more appropriate to describe the term such as mass as having undergone a uh, denotional refinement. In, 18, in 1974, Donald Davidson objected that the concept of incommensurable scientific paradigms competing with each other is logically consistent. 
In his article, Davidson goes well beyond the semantic version of incommensurability thesis to make sense of the idea of language independent of translation requires a distinction between conceptual schemes and content organized by such schemes. But Davidson argues no coherent sense can be made of the idea of a conceptual schema and therefore no sense may be attached to the idea of an untranslatable language. Incommensurability and perception. The close connection between the interpretationalist hypothesis and the holistic conception of beliefs is at the root of the notion of the dependence of perception on theory, the central concept of the stru structure of scientific revolutions. Kuhn maintained that the perception of the world depends on how the percipient conceives the world. Two scientists who witness the same phenomenon are steeped in two radically different theories who will see two different things. According to this view, our interpretation of the world determines what we see. Jerry Fodor attempts to establish this theoretical paradigm is fallacious and misleading by demonstrating the impenetrability of perception to the background knowledge of subjects. The strongest case can be based on the evidence from experiment cogn cognitive psychology, namely the persistence of perceptual illusion, knowing that the lines in the muller liar illusion seen here are equal does not prevent one from continuing to see one line as being longer than the other. The impenetrability of the information elaborated by the mental modules limits the scope of the interpretationism. In epistemology, for example, the criticism of what Fodor calls the impenetralist hypothesis accounts for the common sense intuition on which naive physics is based on the independence of reality from the conceptual categories of the experimenter. In this process of elaboration of the mental modules are in fact independent of the background theories, then it's possible to maintain the realist view of the two scientists who embrace two radically diverse theories see the world exactly the same manner, even if they interpret it differently. The point is that it is necessary to distinguish between observations and the perceptual fixation of beliefs. Well, it's beyond doubt that the second process involves the holistic relationship between beliefs. The first is largely independent of the background beliefs of individuals. Other critics, critics such as Israel Schleffer, Hillary Putnam, and Saul Kripke, Kripke have focused on the Fragian distinction between sense and inference, sense and reference in order to defend scientific realism. Schaeffer contends that Kuhn confuses the meanings of the terms such as mass with their reference. While the meanings may very well differ, the reference to objects or entities to which the correspondence of the external world remains fixed. Okay, so let me take a brief break for a second. It's gonna say uh, say Krishma and fill up my tea. So I'll be less than uh, less than a minute for that, and then I have some more interesting uh, things to look at. So back in one second. Okay, well, I appreciate everyone tuning in. So, Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis is within the realm of Kuhnian scientific um, structure of scientific revolutions, in that you have multiple conflicting theories that all have explanatory power. So, it's not necessarily the determination of the correct theory. It's a relative truth value and a recognition for 
which theories have better explanatory power for various fields and hopefully a method like a truth discovery function that would be able to give you a, a relative truth value for various theories within various domains and hopefully that would be possibly like a, like a machine learning iterative algorithm with a feedback mechanism that uh, you know, that hopefully I'll be working on in relationship. Uh, you know, but the, this is the precursor philosophy, uh, you know, probably most notably something like uh, you know, the Kuhnian scientific revolutions. But you know, noting also all of the critiques and the, you know the possibility that uh, you know, so I'm not looking to take a school. I'm looking to navigate all of the various possibilities. Okay, so I have some more stuff to look at. Um, we'll see if I have strength. You know, like might. Uh, so, anyone's been following Week in Review the last few weeks? Yeah, thanks. Uh, they uh, Salem Pro and Reiner. Um, good to see you. And Pastoro, appreciate your activity in the chat. So. My basic synopsis was Descartes' dualism changed the structure of ancient dualism, of the Greek Aristotelian hylomorphism, where the duality was not centered upon consciousness, but was centered upon matter and forms. And as were Descartes unified the hylomorphic aspect with the unification of algebra and geometry of, so to say, shapes and objects within matter, and then had a separate realm for consciousness. And so what happened, the rise of materialism that essentially starts with Thomas Hobbes, where Descartes creates the foundation for a materialistic laws of uni universal mathematical laws of the material realm. And then Descartes held that there was a separate realm of consciousness, thought, um, and other aspects. However, Hobbes is really the first to somewhat eliminate the Cartesian spiritual realm. And so Hobbes is an important uh, precursor. And then also the attempted, you want to talk about the limitations of science, the attempt at applying the scientific method to politics, morals, and ethics. And sometimes you think like a system of karma, um, like a scientific approach to karma, laws of action, reaction, conservation, um, logic, and you know, so for that part, Hobbes plays an important part. So let me read through a little bit here of Hobbes' philosophy of science. Thomas Hobbes is rightly regarded as a monumental figure in the history of philosophy, especially for his masterpiece, Leviathan, 1851. The scholarly literature on Leviathan is voluminous and has been especially focused upon issues in political philosophy such as representation, author, authorization, sovereignty, and absolutism, contracts and covenants, and the relation of civil authority to religion, among others. Since its printing, the portrayal of Leviathan of humans in their natural state and the existence that is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short has struck the imagination of many of Hobbes' readers leaving many seeing Hobbes as a pessimist at best or hopelessly unrealistic at worst. In Hobbes' own time, however, he was also well-known, even if somewhat ridiculed, for his views on mathematics, natural philosophy, and optics. There are a number of possible explanations for this decline in the opinion of Hobbes' competence in these areas, including his numerous attempts to square the circle, the association of his views with atheism by many critics, and the conflicts he had with Robert Boyle at the time of the rise of experimental philosophy. These all contributed to some extent to Hobbes' exclusion from the Royal Society when it was founded. 
First, Hobbes himself understood his political philosophy, or as he called it, civil philosophy, to be a science capable of demonstration. Thus, understanding his general views about the nature of scientific demonstration promises to shed light on the way in which he saw civil philosophy as scientific. Second, Hobbes understood natural philosophical explanations in physics as needing to make use of mathematical principles to count, as he says, as true physics. This may seem like a banal claim to the 21st century reader, but is not so to the many 16th and 17th centuries. Hobbes' natural philosophy thus situates them within the shift for qualitative to quantitative physics. Third, Hobbes' conflict with the Royal Society shows us not only his views on the role of experimentation, but also on the contextual lies and the rise of experimentalism. So if anyone wants to read along, so I just have parts of this outlined. Criteria for scientific knowledge. The fundamental aspect of Hobbes' materialisms are well known. Hobbes believed that everything that exists is a body and that bodies are sometimes in motion and sometimes at rest. Furthermore, he held that only essential properties of body, the only essential property of body is extension or magnitude. All other apparent properties of bodies, such as those as color, taste, the firmness, and the, are the results of motion from bodies being continued through media to human sense organs. These motions, which continue into the bodies of perceivers, are constitutive of conceptions or ideas. Ideas of the objects of senses are caused by motions from things outside of perceivers, and those continued motions constitute ideas and serve to individuate from one form, one idea from another. Thus, all ideas in the human mind are either from sense perception or derived from ideas gained by sense perception. This account of the origin and nature of ideas shows Hobbes' clear empiricist leanings. However, Hobbes does not hold that knowers should uncritically accept what the ideas of sense objects seem to represent. Like many other philosophers in the 17th century, Hobbes held that our knowledge of the external world was not direct, but was instead mediated by ideas. This recognition that we compute nothing but our phantasms or ideas resulted in two worries about human knowledge. First, knowers must examine what resemblance ideas in the mind have to objects in the outside world. This worry seems similar at first glance to the concern of Descartes' uh, med meditator in the Meditations of First Philosophy, 1641, but Hobbes aimed to provide a solution that made no reference whatsoever to God or anything at all immaterial, such as the soul. In the early works, Elements of Law, composed in 1640 and published in 1650, Hobbes offered arguments that attempt to show that ideas are distinct from what they purport to represent any claim that as a result we could know that the so-called secondary qualities such as color, taste, and sound were not in bodies. To do this, he used everyday experience to provide evidence for his claims. The second worry that followed Hobbes' view that we have only mediated access to bodies in the world relates to the probability of gaining knowledge of the causes of natural events. Most of the ideas that knowers possess of bodies are received passively when interested in the cause of some phenomenon all one may examine our ideas caused by the motions of the bodies involved. However, when interested in, say, the cause of billiard ball B being put into motion after apparent contact with moving billiard ball A, one does not find the idea of A being the cause of B's motion. Even if one were to look at a lower level, as it were, smaller than the billiard balls by use of a microscope, one would not find the idea of A's motion causing B's motions. Hobbes diagnosed this lack of causal knowledge by highlighting that human agents are not the makers of natural phenomena. He seemed to think that makers gain this causal knowledge by attending to their constructions through the process of creating. Since we lack the ideas of causes of individual phenomena from our experience, Hobbes claims that we cannot know their actual causes at all. All that we may know are possible causes. Hobbes asserted in Six Lessons to the Professors of Mathematics, 1656, that because of natural bodies, we know not the, the, not the construction, but seek it from its effects. We, cannot, we can know only of what the causes may be. The second worry brings to the four Hobbes condition for the possibility of scientific knowledge, namely the possession of actual causal knowledge. He claimed that we are said to know Skyer some effort effect when we know what his causes are, in what subjects are, in what subject they introduce the effect or how they do it. Therefore, this is what knowledge, science, 
or of causes. Having scientific knowledge requires one to know the actual causes of phenomenon, not its mere possible causes. However, the only way to possess such causal knowledge is to act as a maker as God did in the case of natural things. This restriction that Hobbes made allowed him to consider only geometry and civil philosophy as bodies of scientific knowledge, since in only these disciplines do humans make the objects that they study. In Six Lessons of the Professor of Mathematics, Hobbes distinguished these two disciplines from all others by connecting them to making. Geometry, therefore, is demonstrable for the lines and figures from which we reason are drawn and described by ourselves, and a civil philosophy is demonstrated because we, the com we make the commonwealth ourselves. In the three following sections, this entry will consider the ways in which these two bodies of scientific knowledge are used within other disciplines to provide an epistemic grounding for the explanations therein. In natural philosophy or physics, Hobbes borrowed geometric principles to provide the cause, the reasons why for many phenomenon, while well, the making of the commonwealth and its laws out of the state of nature was the genesis of civil philosophy. The use of mathematics and hypothesis in scientific explanations. Hobbes explicitly borrows principles from mathematics to use in natural philosophy. This section will discuss these three approaches to understanding how the parts of Hobbes' system fit in with one another and then provide an example of an explanation of Hobbes' natural philosophy from De Capore. First, the unified view. A significant number of scholars have argued that Hobbes understood his philosophy as unified by deductive connections between the different parts. The stronger version of the unified view understands Hobbes to be a type of reductionist, wherein descriptions of macroscopic bodies such as humans and rocks ultimately reduce to microscopic bodies responsible for all phenomenon. Ellen Ryan articulates the reductionist view as follows. Hobbes believed as firmly as one could that all behavior, whether of animate or inanimate material, was ultimately to be explained in terms of particulate motion. The laws of governing the motion of discrete material particles were the ultimate laws of the universe. And in the sense, psychology must be rooted in the physiology and physiology in physics, while the social sciences, especially the technology of statecraft, must be rooted in psychology. By the beginning of the first principles, one will move from the first philosophy to geometry and from geometry to physics. He continued by claiming that after physics, we came to morals. Indeed, Hobbes claims that moral philosophy must be studied after physics because the passions have their causes in sense, experience, and imagination. However, he argued that civil and moral philosophy do not so adhere to one another, but they, they may be severed. The separation is permissible, Hobbes claimed, because in addition to leaning to learning moral philosophy from the first principles, each individual could simply study the motions of their own mind and gain knowledge of the same principles. A further difficulty for the unified view is that even if Hobbes did see the connection between, say, physics and moral philosophy as deductive, it is not obvious how that deduction would work because moral philosophy must add content about human passions, endeavors that is not contained with and thus not deducible from physics. The second major view, the disunified account, seems to be a desire to free Hobbes from what is prima facie a case of deriving normative claims relating to the commonwealth and civic philosophy from descriptive claims related to human psychology and ultimately more general claims in natural philosophy. The third view has more recently been offered that seeks to carve a middle path between the unified and disunified interpretations. We call this view the mixed mathematics view. The understanding of Hobbes' system agrees with the worry raised above for the unified account that higher levels such as geometry do not contain the concepts used in lower level explanations. The mixed mathematics view understands Hobbes having seen certain disciplines as providing causal principles, what he called the why, while other disciplines provide the facts relevant to the given domain, what he called the that. Hobbes identified scientific knowledge, science, with knowing causes, and in his discussions he used language germane to Aristotle's distinction between the why and the that. We are said to know some effect when we know what its causes are, in what subject they are, in what subject they introduce the effect, and how they do it. Therefore, this is knowledge, science, or of causes. All other knowledge is either sense experience or imagination remaining in sense experience or memory. Two types of knowledge thus emerge. There is knowledge from sense experience, retained as imagination, eventually as memory, 
and there is scientific knowledge. When reflecting in De Hamana on the status of claims in physics, Hobbe claims that what he calls true physics must be a mixture of both of these types of knowledge. Since one cannot proceed in reasoning about natural things that are brought about by motion from the effects to the causes without knowledge of those things that follow from that kind of motion, and since one cannot proceed to the consequences of motions without a knowledge of quantity, which is geometry, nothing can be demonstrated by physics without something also being demonstrated a priori. Therefore, physics, true physics that depends on geometry is usually numbered among the mixed mathematics. Therefore, those mathematics are pure, which, like geometry and arithmetic, revolve around quantities in the abstract, so that work in them requires no knowledge of the subject. Those mathematics are mixed in truth within the reasoning. Some quality of the subject is also considered, as is the case with astronomy, music, physics, and the parts of physics that can vary on account of the variety of species and the parts of the universe. These two statements concerning the status of different types of knowledge and the requirement to mix qualities in the abstract with some quality in the subject of the subject in physics can aid in making sense of Hobbes' actual explanatory practice. What does it mean for physics to be mixed mathematics? For Hobbes, it means that for many explanations, one will first establish some fact is the case by appealing to sense experience, but to give the reason why one must borrow a principle from geometry. Hobbes on experimentation, conflict with Robert Boyle and the Royal Society. Hobbes' conflict with Robert, Bo Robert Boyle concerning the nature of natural philosophy in general and the air pump experiments in particular took place over several years in a series of publications. Boyle talked about the laws of nature as established by God. Hobbes restricted discussion of laws to the laws of human conduct discovered by those who escaped the state of nature and created commonwealth. In contrast to laws of the natural world, Hobbes articulated a prior principles of motion and the foundation of his physics, rather than being known as the laws of motion issued by some divine lawmaker. These Hobbesian principles of motion are ex explicated by thought experiments and seem to rely upon a version of the principle of sufficient reason. Although Hobbes held that there were true of all human experience, since Hobbes holds that we cannot know the actual causes of natural phenomenon, he would have to admit that nature might, on Spinoza's to us, act otherwise. However, despite these differences, the primary dissimilarity that emerges between Hobbes and Boyle's concerning the air pump experiment is one of method as it relates to the status of experiments experience. Given that Hobbes was convinced that of the impossibility of knowing the actual causes of natural phenomenon, he held that any phenomenon admits of multiple possible explanations. This should not be taken to imply that Hobbes saw all explanations and thus all possible causes or suppositions is standing on equal footing. And Hobbes held Hobbes held that the work in first philosophy and geometry must be completed prior to attempting to make any explanation in natural philosophy. This seems to be what Hobbes meant when he said that nothing can be demonstrated by physics without something also being demonstrated a priori. When giving an explanation, Hobbes held that one should ideally appeal to those causes that are demonstrable from geometry when mixed with facts and rule out those that are not intelligible according to geometric principles. In contrast, Boyle's method prescribing that instead of bringing causal principles to an experiment and expecting to explain some phenomenon by appeal to those principles, one should attempt to arrive at a supposition that would explain a phenomenon only after repeated careful experiments. Thomas Spat, Spratt detailed the care taken in the design of experiments and the manner in which the Royal Society members were formed into committees that shared parts of the experiment so that by this union of eyes and hands, they were able to gain a full comprehension of the objects and all its appearances. We can make sense of Hobbes' direct criticisms of Boyle's prioritization of experiments. With this methodological difference in mind, Hobbes' view of the foundational role played by first philosophy and mathematics over experiment experience is clear when he claimed in Dialogue Logus Physicus that ingenuity is one thing and method is another. Here, method is needed. The causes of those things done by motion are to be investigated through knowledge of motion, the knowledge of which the noblest part of geometry is hitherto untouched. According to Hobbes, then, one must have geometric principles already in place to aid in choosing a supposition before engaging in experiments. Unlike the Royal Society's aim to have multiple members examine the same object, Hobbes emphasized the need for individual conceptual clarity, something that could be accomplished from an armchair. Criticism from Hobbes and Boyle's rebuttals, relying upon evidence from experiments, 
could be seen as a conflict of Boyle's experimental nature, natural philosophy against a form of speculative natural philosophy. However, it is important to avoiding taking Hobbes' criticism of Boyle's method to imply that Hobbes completely eschewed experiment experience while engaging in natural philosophical explanations. Instead, Hobbes views exper viewed experiment experience as playing the role of establishing that some phenomenon occurs, what he, what we have seen he called the that. But one should never hope, according to Hobbes, to glean a possible cause from mere observations, even those observations were carefully documented and repeated many times. The prospects of a science of civil philosophy. Hobbes thought that he would be renowned as the founder of civil philosophy, just as he saw Copernicus having initiated the beginning of astronomy, Galileo was having opened the gate of natural philosophy universal with an account of the nature of motion, and William Harvey is having first discovered the science of man's body. Hobbes was well aware of many works from antiquity to his own time addressing issues relevant to civil philosophy. By claiming civil philosophy was his invention, he intended to deny that any of these preceding works counted as philosophy. Okay, so just a little bit of Hobbes and his philosophy of science, and this is going to become important moving forward in the multi, multiple truth hypothesis. Also kind of understand where Hobbes uh, diminishes the value of the scientific method while at the same time implying that he has a new take from the classics of like the Greek on things like ethics and civics by the employment of the scientific method. So um, you said largely Hobbes' philosophy of science is rejected, but you know as a contemporary of Descartes and uh, Newton and uh, you know, Boyle and the found founding of the Royal Society, it is rejection from it. That was important to bring that up. So. Let's keep it going. So let's look at theory and observation in science. Scientists obtain a great deal of the evidence that they use by collecting and producing empirical results. Much of the standard philosophical literature on the subjects comes from the 20th century logical empiricists, there's followers and critics who embrace their issues while objecting to some of their aims and assumptions. The logical empiricists and their followers devoted much of their attention to the distinction between observables and unobservables, the form and content of observation reports, and the epistemic bearings of observational evidence on theories it is used to evaluate. Philosophical work in this tradition was characterized by the aim of conceptually separating theory and observation so that observation could serve as the pure basis of theory appraisal. More recently, the focus of philosophical literature has shifted away from these issues and their close association to the languages of logics of science to investigations of how empirical data are generated, analyzed, and used in practice. With this shift, we also see philosophers largely setting out aside the aspiration of a pure observational basis for scientific knowledge and instead embracing a view of science in which the theoretical and empirical are usefully intertwined. Philosophers of science have traditionally recognized a special role for observation in the epistemology of science. Observations of the conduit through which the tribunal of experience delivers its verdict on scientific hypotheses and theories. The evidential value of an observation has been assumed to depend on how sensitive it is to whatever it is used to study. But this in turn depends on the adequacy of any theoretical claim its sensitivity may depend on. Recent scholarship has turned this question on its head. Why think that the theory ladenness of empirical results would be problematic in the first place? If the theoretical assumptions with which the results are imbued are correct, what is the harm of it? After all, it is the virtue of those assumptions that the fruits of empirical investigation can be put in touch with theorizing at all. 
philosophers have embraced an entangled picture of the theoretical and empirical, empirical that goes much deeper than this. Lloyd, 2012, advocates for what she calls complex empiricism in which there is no pristine separation of model and data. Bogan, 2016, points out the impure empirical evidence, evidence that incorporates the judgments of scientists often tell us more about the world than it could have it were pure. Indeed, Logino, 2020, has argued that naive fantasy that data have an immediate relation to phenomena of the world, that they are objective in some strong ontological sense of that term, that they are facts of the world directly speaking to us, should be finally laid to rest, and that even the primary original state of data is not free from researchers value or theory laid in selection and organization. There's not widespread agreement among philosophers of science about how to characterize the nature of scientific theories. What is a theory? According to the traditional syntactic view, theories are considered to be collections of sentences couched in logical language, which must then be supplemented with correspondence rules in order to be interpreted. Construed in this way, theories include maximally generally explanatory and predictive laws, along with lesser generalizations that describe more limited natural and experimental phenomena. In contrast, the semantic view cast theories as the space of states possible according to the theory or set of mathematical models permissible according to the theory. However, there are also significantly more economical interpretations of what it means to be a scientific theory, which include elements of diverse kinds. To take just one illustrative example, Borelli, 2012, characterizes the standard model of particle physics as a theoretical framework involving what she calls theoretical, theoretical cores that are composed of mathematical structures, verbal stories, and analogies with empirical references mixed together. This entry aims to accommodate all of these views about the nature of scientific theories. In this entry, we trace the contours of traditional philosophical engagement with the questions surrounding theory and observation in science that attempted to segregate the theoretical from the observational and to cleanly delineate between the observable and the unobservable. We also discussed the more recent scholarship that supplants the primacy of observation by human sensory perception with an instrument inclusive conception of data production and that embraces the interwining of theoretical and empirical in the production of useful scientific results. Although theory testing dominates much of the standard philosophical literature on observation, much of what this entry says about the role of observation in theory testing applies also to its role in inventing and modifying theories and applying them to tasks in engineering, medicine, and other practices. Observation and data. Traditional empiricism. Reasoning from observation has been important to scientific practice at least since the time of Aristotle. Francis Bacon argued long ago the best way to discover things about nature is to use experiences, his term for observation as well as experimental results, to develop and improve scientific theories. The role of the observational evidence in scientific discovery was an important topic for Wewell and Mill, among others in the 19th century, but philosophers didn't talk about observation as extensively in as much detail or in the way we have become accustomed to until the 20th century when logical empiricists transformed philosophical thinking about it. One important transformation characteristic of the linguistic turn of philosophy was to concentrate on the logic of observational reports rather than on objects or phenomena observed. This focus makes sense on the assumption that scientific theory is a system of sentences or sentence-like structures, propositions, statements, claims, and so on, to be tested by comparison to observational evidence. It was assumed that the comparison must be understood in terms of inferential relations. If inferential relations hold only between sentence-like structures, it follows that theories must be tested not against observations or things observed, but against sentences, propositions used to report observations. Theory testing was treated as a matter of comparison. Observation sentences describing observations made in natural or laboratory settings to observation sentences that should be true according to the theory to be tested. This was to be accomplished by using laws or law-like generalizations along with descriptions of initial conditions, conditions, correspondence rules, and auxiliary hypotheses to derive observation sentences describing the sensory deliverances of interest. This makes it imperative to ask what observation sentences report. According to what Hempel called the phenomenalist account, observational reports describe the observer's subject, subjective perceptual experiences. 
such experimental data might be conceived as being sensations, perceptions, and similar phenomenon of immediate experience. This view is motivated by the assumption that the epistemic value of an observation report depends upon its truth or accuracy, and that with regard to perception, the only thing observers can know with certainty to be true or accurate is how things appear to them. This means that we cannot be confident that observation reports are true or accurate if they describe anything beyond the observer's own perceptual experience. Presumably, one's confidence in conclusion should not exceed one's confidence in one's best relation to believe it. For the phenomenalist, it follows that reports of subjective experience can provide better reasons to believe claims if they support claims they support than reports of other kinds of evidence. However, given the impressive limitations of the language available for reporting subjective experiences, we cannot expect phenomenalistic reports to be precise and unambiguous enough to test theoretical claims whose evaluation requires accurate, fine-grained perceptual discriminations. Worse yet, if experiences are directly available only to those who have them, there is no room to doubt whether different people can understand the same observation sentence in the same way. Such considerations led Hempel to propose, contrary to the phenomenalist, phenomen, phenomenalists, that observation sentences report directly observable, intersubjectively ascertainable facts about physical objects. That the facts expressed in observation reports be intersubjectively ascertainable was critical for the aims of logical empiricists. They hope to articulate and explain the authoritativeness widely conceded to the best natural, social, and behavioral scientific theories in contrast to propaganda and pseudoscience. The logical empiricists tried to account for the genuine credibility of scientific theories by appeal to the objectivity and accessibility of observational reports and the logic of theory testing. Part of what they meant by calling observational evidence objective was the cultural and ethnic factors have no bearing on what can validly be inferred about the merits of a theory from observational reports. So conceived objectivity was important to the logical empiricist criticism of the Nazi idea that Jews and Aryans have fundamentally different thought processes, such as the physical theories suitable for Einstein and his kind should not be inflicted on German students. In response to this rationale for ethnic and cultural purging of the German educational system, the logical empiricist argued that because of its objectivity, observational evidence rather than ethnic and cultural factors should be used to evaluate scientific theories. In this way, thinking, observational evidence, and its subsequent bearing on scientific theories are objective, also in virtue of being free from non-epistemic values. Ensuring generations of philosophers and science has found the logical empiricist focus on expressing the content of observation in a rarefied and basic observation language too narrow. Search for suitably universal language as required by the logical empiricist program has come to em come up empty-handed, and most philosophers of science have given up its pursuit. Moreover, as we discuss in the following section, the centrality of observation itself to the aims of empiricism and philosophy of science has also come under scrutiny. However, leaving the search for universal pure observation language behind does not automatically undercut the norm of objectivity as it relates to the social, political, and cultural con contents of scientific research. Pristine logical foundations aside, the objectivity of neutral observations in the face of noxious political propaganda was appealing because it could serve as shared ground available for intersubjective appraisal. The appeal remains alive and well today, particularly as pernicious misinformation campaigns are again formidable in public discourse. If individuals can generally appraise the significance of empirical evidence and come to well-justified agreement about how the evidence bears on theorizing, then they can protect their epistemic deliberations from the undue influence of fascists and other nefarious manipulators. However, this aspiration must face sub subtleties arising from the social epistemology of science and from the nature of empirical results themselves. In practice, the appraisable scientific Results can often require expertise that is not readily accessible to members of the public without the relevant specializing training. Additionally, precisely because empirical results are not pure observation reports, their appraisal across communities of inquiries operating with different background assumptions can require significant epistemic work. The logical empiricists pay little attention to the distinction between observing and experimenting and its epistemic implications. For some philosophers to experiment is to isolate, prepare, and manipulate things in hopes of producing epistemically useful evidence. It had be, 
been customary to think of observing as noticing and attending to interesting details of things perceived under more or less natural conditions or by extension, things perceived during the course of an experiment. By now, many philosophers have argued that contrivance and manipulation influence epistemic significance features of observable experiments results to such an extent that epistemologists ignore them at their pearl. Robert Boyle, John Herschel, Bruno Latour, and Stephen Wolligar, in Hacking, Harry Collins, Alan Franklin, Peter Gelson, Jim Bogan, and Jim Woodward, and Hangs, George Reinberger, are some of the philosophers and philosophically minded scientists, historians, and sociologists of science who gave serious consideration to the distinction between observing and experimenting. The logical empiricists tended to ignore it. Interestingly, the contemporary vantage point that attends to modeling data processing empirical results may suggest a reunification of the observation and intervention under the same epistemological framework when one no longer thinks of scientific observation as pure or direct and recognizes the power of good modeling to account for confounds without physically intervening on target systems, the purported epistemic distinction between observation and intervention loses its spite. Hey, Bubble, thanks for tuning in. God bless. The irrelevance of observation per se. Observers may use magnifying glass microscopes or telescopes to see things that are too small or too far away to be seen or seen clearly enough without them. Similarly, amplification devices are used to hear faint sounds, but if it were to observe something is to perceive it, not every use of instruments to augment the sense qualifies as observation. Philosophers generally agree that you can observe the moons of Jupiter with a telescope or a heartbeat with a uh, stethoscope. The Van Frazen of the scientific image is a notable exception for whom to be observable meant to be something that were present to creatures like us would be observed. Thus, for Van Fressen, the moons of Jupiter are observable since astronauts will no doubt be able to see them as well from up close. In contrast, microscopic entities are not observable on the Van Fressen account because creatures like us cannot strategically maneuver ourselves to see them present before us with our unaided senses. Many philosophers have criticized Van Fressen's view as overly restrictive. Nevertheless, philosophers differ in their willingness to draw the line between what counts as observable and what does not along the spectrum of increasingly complicated instrumentation. Many philosophers who don't mind telescopes and microscopes still find it unnatural to say that high-energy physics observes particles or particle interactions when they look at bubble chamber photographs, let alone digital visualizations of energy depositions left in calorimeters that are not themselves inspected. Their intuitions come from the plausible assumption that one can observe only what can see by looking, hearing, or listening, feel by touching, and so on. Investigators can neither look at, direct their gaze to, or attend to, nor visually experience charged particles moving through a detector. Instead, they can look at and see the tracks in the chamber, in bubble chamber photographs, calorimeter data visualizations, etc. In more contentious examples, some philosophers have moved to speaking of instrument augmented empirical research as more like tool use than sensing. Hacking 1981 argues that we do not see through a microscope, but rather with it. Dotson Gallison 2007 highlight that inherent interactivity of scanning tunneling microscopes in which scientists image and manipulate atoms by exchanging electrons between the sharp tip of the microscope and the surface to be image. Others have opted to stretch the meaning of observation to accommodate what we might otherwise be tempted to call instrument-aided detections. For instance, uh, Shapiro, 1982, argues that while it may initially strike philosophers as counterintuitive, it makes perfect sense to call the detection of neutrinos from the interior of the sun direct observation. The variety of views on the observable, unobservable distinction hint that empiricists may have been barking up the wrong philosophical tree. Many of the things scientists investigate will not interact with human perceptual systems as required to produce perceptual experiments of them. The method investigators use to study such things argue against the idea, however plausible it may once have seemed, that scientists do or should rarely rely exclusively on their perceptual systems to obtain the evidence they need. Thus, Feyerbin proposed as a thought experiment that if measuring equipment was rigged up to a register the magnitude of a quantity of interest, a theory could be tested just as well against its output as against 
records of human perceptions. Fairbairn could have made his point with historical examples instead of thought experiments a century earlier. Hemholtz estimated the speed of excitatory impulses traveling through a motor nerve. To find out how long it took the impulse to reach the muscle, he had to know when the stimulating currents reached the nerve. But our senses are not capable of directly perceiving the individual moment of time with such small durations. And so Hemholtz had to resort to what he called artificial methods of observation. The sense of artificial observation is not to be confused with using a magnifying glass or telescope to see a tiny or distant object. Such devices enable the observer to scrutinize visual objects. The minuscule duration of the current flow is not a visual object. Hemmelt studied it cleverly by concocting circumstances so that the deflection of the needle would meaningfully convey information he needed. Hook in 1705 argued for the design instruments to execute the same strategy in the 17th century. It is of interest that records of perceptual observation are not always epistemically superior to data collected via experimental equipment. Indeed, it is not unusual for investigators to use non-perceptual evidence to evaluate perceptual data and correct for its errors. When the process of producing data is relatively convoluted, it is even easier to see that human sense perception is not the ultimate epistemic engine. Consider function magnetic resonant images, fMRI of the brain decorated with colors to indicate magnitudes of electric activity in different regions during the performance of the cognitive task. The role of the senses in the fMRI data production is limited to such thing as monitoring the equipment and keeping an eye on the subject. The epistemic role is limited to discriminating the colors in the finished image reading tables of numbers the computer used to assign them and so on. Well, it's true that researchers typically use their sense of sight to take in visualizations of processed fMRI data, the numbers on the page or screen for that matter, this is not the primary locus of epistemic action. Researchers learn about brain processes through fMRI data to the extent that they do primary in virtue of the suitability of the causal connection between the target processes and the data records and of the transformation those data undergo when they're processed into onto maps or other results that scientists want to use. This interesting questions are not about observability. The epistemic significance of the fMRI data depends on their delivering us the right sort of access to the target, but observation is neither necessary nor sufficient for that access. Following Shapiro in 1982, one could respond by adopting an extremely permissive view of what accounts as observation so as to allow even highly processed data to count as observation. However, it is hard to reconcile the idea that highly processed data like fMRI images record observations with the traditional empiricist notion that calculations involving theoretical assumptions and background beliefs must not be allowed on pain of loss of objectivity to intrude in the process of data production. Observation garnered its special epistemic status in the first place because it seemed more direct, more immediate, and therefore less distorted and muddled than, say, detection or inference. The production of FRI images requires extensive statistical manipulation based on theories about the radio signals and a variety of factors having to do with their detection, along with the beliefs about relation between blood oxygen levels and neural activity, sources of systematic error, and more. Insofar as the use of the term observation connotes this extra baggage of traditional empiricism, it may be better to replace observation talk with a terminology that is more obviously permissive, such as that is empirical data and empirical results. Data and phenomena. Deposing observation from traditional, from its traditional perch in empiricist epistemologies of science needs not a strange philosophers from scientific practice. Terms like observation, observational reports do not occur nearly as much in the scientific as in philosophical writings. In their place, working scientists tend to talk about data. Philosophers who adopt their, this usage are free to think about standard ob examples of observation as members of large, diverse, and growing family of data production methods. Instead of trying to decide which methods to classify as observation or which things qualify as observable, philosophers can tend can then concentrate on the epistemic influence of the factors that differentiate members of the family. In particular, they can focus their attention on what questions data produced by a given method can be used to answer what most what must be done to use that data fruitively and the credibility of the answers they afford. Satisfactory answering such questions warrants further philosophical work, as Bogan and Woodward, 1988, have argued, there's often a long road between obtaining a particular data set replete with idiosyncrasies born of unspecified causal nuances, 
to any claim about the phenomenon ultimately of interest to the researchers. Empirical data are typically produced in ways that make it possible to predict them from generalizations they are used to test or to derive instances of those generalizations from data and non ad hoc auxiliary hypothesis. Indeed, it is unusual for many members of a set of reasonably precise quantitative data to agree with one another, let alone with quantitative prediction. This is because precise publicly accessible data typically cannot be produced except through processes whose results reflect the influence of causal factors that are too numerous, too difficult, different in kind, and too irregular in behavior for any single theory to account for them. The effects of systematic and random sources of error are typically such that considerable analysis and interpretation are required to take investigation from data sets to the conclusions that can be used to evaluate theoretical claims. Interesting, this applies as much to clear cases of perceptual data as to machine produced records when 19th and 20th century astronomers look through the telescope and push buttons to record the time which they saw a star pass across here. The values of their data points depended not only upon the light from the stars, but also upon the features of perceptual processes, reaction times, and other psychological factors that vary from observation to observer to observer. No astronomical theory has the resource that takes such things into account. Instead of testing theoretical claims by direct comparison to the data initially collected, investigators use the data to infer facts about phenomenon, events, regularities, processes, whose institutes are uniform and uncomplicated enough to make them susceptible to systemic predictions and explanation. Leonality has challenged Bogan and Woodward's claim that data are, as she puts it, unavoidably embedded in one experimental context. She argues that when data are suitably packaged, they can travel to new epistemic contexts and retain epistemic utility. It is not just claims about phenomena that can travel, data travel too. Preparing data for safe travel involves work, and by tracing data journey, philosophers can learn about how the careful labor of researchers, data archivists, and database curators can facilitate useful data mobility. The fact that there is typically predict and explain features of phenomenon rather than idiosyncratic data should not be interpreted as failing. For many purposes, this is more useful and illuminating capacity. However, there are circumstances in which sciences do want to explain data. In empirical research, it is often crucial to getting a useful signal that scientists deal with sources of background noise and confounding signals. This is part of the long road from newly collected data to useful empirical results, an important step on the way to eliminating unwanted noise or confounds as determine their sources. Different sources of noise can have different characteristics that can be derived from explained by theory. There are also circumstances in which scientists want to provide a substantive detailed explanation for a particular idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic datum and even circumstances in which procuring such explanations is epistemically imperative, ignoring outliers with good epistemic reasons is just cherry picking data, one of the canonical questionable research practices. Thus, while in transforming data as collected into something useful for learning about phenomenon, scientists often account for features of the data, such as different types of noise contributions, and sometimes even explain the odd outlying data point or artifact, then simply do not explain every individual teensy tiny tiny causal contribution to the exact character of data set or datum in full detail. This is because scientists can neither discover such causal minutia, nor would their invocation be necessary for typical research questions. The fact that it may sometimes be important for scientists to provide detailed explanations of data and not just claims about phenomenon inferred from the data should not be confused with the dubious claim that scientists could in principle detail every causal quirk that contributed to some data. In view of all this, together with the fact that a great many theoretical claims can only be tested directly against facts about phenomenon, it behooves epistemologists to think about how data are used to answer questions about phenomenon. Lacking space and detailed discussion, the most this entry can do is to mention two main kinds of things investigators do in order to draw conclusions from data. The first is causal analysis carried out with or without the use of statistical techniques. The second is not causal statistical analysis. First, investigators must distinguish features of the data that are indicative of the facts about the phenomenon of interest from those which can be safely ignored and those which must be corrected for. Sometimes background knowledge makes this easy. 
the answer to questions about which features of numerical and non-numerical data are indicative of the phenomenon of interest typically depend at least in part of what is known about the causes that conspire to produce the data. Statistical arguments are often used to deal with the questions about influence of epistemically relevant causal factors. For example, it was known the similar data can be produced by factors that have nothing to do with the phenomenon of interest, Monte Carlo simulations, regression analysis of sample data, and a variety of other statistical techniques sometimes provide investigators with their best chance of deciding how seriously to take a putatively illuminating feature of their data. But statistical techniques are also required for purposes other than causal analysis. Regression and other techniques are applied to the results to estimate how far from the mean the magnitude of interest can be expected to fall in the population of interest. The fact that little can be learned from the data without causal, statistical, and related argumentation has interesting consequences for received ideas about the use of observational evidence distinguished sciences from pseudoscience, religion, and other non-scientific cognitive endeavors. First, scientists are not the only ones to use observational evidence to support their claim. Astrologers and medical quacks use them too to find epistemically significant differences. One must carefully consider what sorts of data they use, where it comes from, and how it is employed. The virtues of scientific as opposed to non-scientific theory evaluation depends not only on the reliance on empirical data, but also on how the data is produced, analyzed, and interpreted to draw conclusions against which theories can be evaluated. Secondly, it does not take many examples to refute the notion that adherence to a single universally applicable scientific method differentiates the sciences from the non-sciences. Data are produced and used in far too many different ways to treat information informatively as instance of any single method. Thirdly, it is usually, if not always, impossible for investigators to draw conclusions to test theories against observational data without explicit or implicit reliance on scientific theories. Bukalich 2020 has helpfully outlined a taxonomy of various ways in which data can be model laden to increase their epistemic utility. She focuses on seven categories, data conversion, data correction, data interpolation, data scaling, data fusion, data assimilation, and synthetic data. Of these categories, conversion and correction are perhaps the most familiar. Data correction involves common practices we have already discussed, like modeling and mathematically subtracting background noise contribution from one's data set. Buklich rightly points out that involving models in these ways routinely improves the epistemic values to which data can be put. Data interpolation, scaling, and fusion are also relatively widespread practices that deserve further philosophical analysis. Interpolation involves filling in missing data with a patchy data set under the guidance of models. Data are scaled when they have been generated into a particular scale, and model assumptions are recruited to transform them to apply to another scale. Data are fused in Buklich terminology when data collected in diverse contexts using diverse methods are combined or integrated together. For instance, when data from ice cores, tree wings, and historical logbooks of the sea captains are merged into a joint climate data set, scientists must take care in combining data of diverse provenience, provenience and model new uncertainties arising from the very amalgamation of data sets. Buklis contrasts synthetic data with what she calls real data. Synthetic data are virtual or simulated data and are not produced by physical interaction with worldly research targets. Buklis emphasized the role that simulated data can usefully play in testing and troubleshooting aspects of data processing that are to eventually be deployed on empirical data. It can be incredibly useful for developing and stress testing a data processing pipeline to have fake data sets whose characteristics are already known in virtue of having been produced by the researchers and being available for inspection at will. When the characteristics of data sets are known or indeed can be tailored according to need, the effects of new processing methods can be more readily traced than without. In this way, researchers can familiarize themselves with the effects of the data processing pipeline and make adjustments to the pipeline in light of what they learn by feeding fake data through it before attempting to use the pipeline of actual science data. Such investigations can be critical to eventually arguing for the credibility of the final empirical result and the appropriate interpretation and use. Data simulation is perhaps a less widely appreciated aspect of model-based processing among philosophers of science. Buklich characterizes this method as optimal integration of data with dynamical model, model estimates to provide a more accurate assimilation estimate of the quantity. Thus, data assimilates Assimilation involves 
balancing the contributions and empirical data and the output of models in an integrated estimate according to uncertainties associated with these contributions. Buklich argues that the involvement of models in these various aspects of data processing does not necessarily lead to better epistemic outcomes. Done wrong, integrating models and data can introduce artifacts and make the process data unreliable for the purpose at hand. Indeed, she notes there is much work for methodological, reflective scientists and philosophies of, philosophers of science to do in a string out cases in which model data symbiosis may be problematic or circular. Theory, theory and value ladenness. Empirical results are laden with values of theoretical commitments. Philosophers have raised and appraised several possible kinds of epistemic problems that could be associated with theory and or value laden empirical results. They've worried about the extent to which human perception itself is distorted by our commitments. They have worried that drawing upon theoretical resources from the very theory to be appraised or its competitors in the generation of empirical results yields vicious circularity or inconsistency. They have also worried that contingent conceptual and or linguistic frameworks traps bits of evidence like bees and amber so that they cannot carry on their epistemic lives outside their context of their origination and that normative values necessitate necessarily corrupt the integrity of science. Do the theory of value ladenness of empirical results render them hopelessly parochial? That is when scientists leave theoretical commitments behind and adopt new ones must they also relinquish the fruits of empirical research imbued with their prior commitments too? In this section, we discussed the, these worries and responses that philosophers have offered to assuage them. Perception. If you believe that observation by human sense perception is the objective basis of all scientific knowledge, then you ought to be particularly worried about the potential for human perception to be corrupted by theoretical assumptions, wishful thinking, framer, sec, framer effects, and so on. Kuhn took such studies to indicate that things don't look the same to observers with different conceptual resources. By analogy, Kuhn supposed that when observers working in conflicting paradigms look at the same thing, their conceptual limitations should keep them from having the same visual experience. A related issue is that of salience. Kuhn claimed that if Galileo and an Aristotelian physicist had watched the same pendulum experiment, they would not have looked at or attended to the same thing. The Aristotelian paradigm would have required the experimental to measure the weight of the stone, the vertical height to which it had been raised, and the time required for it to achieve rest, and ignore radius angular displacement and time per swing. The last were a salient to Galileo because he treated pendulum swings as constrained circular mo motions. The Galilean quantities would be of no interest to an Aristotelian who treats the stone as falling under constraint towards the center of the earth, the Galileo and the Aristotelians would not have collected the same data. Absent records of Aristotelian pendulum experiments, we can think of this as a thought experiment. Interest change, however, scientists may eventually come to appreciate the significance of data that had not originally been salient to them in light of new presuppositions. The moral of these examples is that although paradigms or theoretical commitments sometimes have an epistemically significant influence on what observers perceive or what they attend to, it can be relatively easy to nullify or correct for their effects. When presuppositions cause epistemic damage, investigators are often able to eventually make corrections. Thus, paradigms or theoretical commitments actually do influence saliency, but their influence is neither inevitable nor irre irredeemable. Irre irremediable. Assuming the theory to be tested, Thomas Kuhn, Norwood Hansen, Paul Feyerbaum, and others cast suspicion on the objectivity of observational evidence in another way by arguing that one cannot use empirical evidence to test a theory without committing oneself to the very theory. This would be a problem that leads to a dogmatism, but assuming the theory to be tested is often benign and even necessary. Epistemologically hand ringing about the use of the very theory to be tested and the generation of the evidence to be used for testing seems to spring per, primarily from a concern about vicious circularity. How can we have a genuine trial if the theory in question has been presumed innocent from the outset? Well, it's true that there would be a serious epistemic problem in the case where the use of the theory to be tested conspired to guarantee that the evidence would turn out to be confirmatory, 
This is not always the case when theories are invoked in their own testing. For any given case, determining whether the theoretical assumptions being made are benign or straightjacketing, the results that it will be possible to obtain will require investigating the particular relationships between the assumptions and the results of that case. When data production and analysis processes are complicated, this task can get difficult, but the point is that merely noting the involvement of the theory to be tested in the generation of empirical results does not by itself imply that those results cannot be objectively useful for deciding whether the theory to be tested should be accepted or rejected. Semantics. Kuhn argued that theoretical commitments exert strong influence on observable descriptions and what they are understood to mean. It is important to bear in mind that observables do not always use declarative sentences to report observational and experimental results. Instead, they are often draw, photograph, make audio recordings, or set up their experimental devices to generate graphs, pictorial image is tables of numbers, and other non <clears throat> sentential records. Obviously, investigators' conceptual resources of theoretical biases can exert epistemically significant influence on what they record or set their equipment to record, which detail they include or emphasize, and which forms of representations they choose. But disagreements about the epistemic import of a graph, picture, or other non-sentential bit of data often turn on causal rather than semantical considerations. Such questions are not and are not well represented as semantic questions to which semantic theory loading is relevant. Late 20th century philosophy may have ignored such cases as exaggerated the influence of semantic theory loading because the thought of theory testing in terms of inferential relations between observation and theoretical sentences. In keeping with Percy Bridgman's view that in general, we mean by concept nothing more than a set of operations. The concept is synonymous with the corresponding set of operations. One might assume that operationalizations are definitions of mere meanings, rules, such that it is analytically true, but is more faithful to actual scientific practice to think of oper operationalizations as def feasible rules for the application of a concept such that both the rules and their applications are subject to revision on the basis of new empirical or theoretical developments. So understood to oper operationalize is to adopt verbal and related practices for the purposes of enabling scientists to do their work. Operationalizations are thus sensitive and subject to changes on the basis of finding that influence their usefulness. Definitional or not, investigators in different research traditions may be trained to report their observations in conformity with conflicting operationalizations. To the contrary, one might object that what one sees should not be confused with what one is trained to say when one sees it. Strictly speaking, the objection concludes the term observational report should be reserved for descriptions that are neutral with respect to conflict conflicting operationalizations. If observational data are just those utterances that meet Feyerbin's decidability and agreeable conditions, the import of semantic theory loading depends on how quickly and for which sentences reasonably sophisticated language users who stand in different paradigms can not inferentially reach the same decisions about what to assert or deny. Someone expect enough agreement to secure the objectivity in observational data, others would not. Still others would try to supply different standards for objectivity. With regard to sentential observation reports, the significance of semantic theory loading is less ubiquitous than one might expect. The interpretation of verbal report often depends on ideas about causal structure rather than the meanings of science. Rather than worrying about the meaning of words used to describe their observation, scientists are more likely to wonder whether the observ observers made up or withheld information, whether one or more details were artifacts or observation conditions, whether the specimens were atypical and so on. Note that the worry about semantic theory loading extends beyond observation reports of the sort that occupied the logical empiricists and their close intellectual descendants, combining results of the diverse methods for making proxy measurements of the paleoclimate temperatures in an epistemically responsible way requires careful attention to the variety of operationalizations 
at play. Even so, observation reports are involved. The sticky question about how to usefully merge results obtained in different ways in order to satisfy one's epistemic aims remains. Happily, the remedy for worry about semantic loading in this broad sense is likely to be the same, investigating the provenance of these results and comparing the variety of factors they have contributed to in their causal production. Kuhn placed too much emphasis on the discontinuity between the evidence generated in different paradigms. Even if we accept a broadly Kuhnian picture, according to which paradigms are heterogeneous collections of experimental practices, theoretical principles, problems selected for investigation, approaches to their solutions, Connections between components are loose enough to allow investigators who disagree profoundly over one of the more theoretical claims to nevertheless agree about how to design, execute, and record the results of their experiments. The success that scientists have in repurposing results generated by others for different purposes speaks against the confinement of evidence to its naive paradigm. Even when scientists working with radically different core theoretical commitments cannot make the same measurements themselves with enough contextual information about how each conducts research it could be, can be possible to construct bridges that span the theoretical divides. Values. One could worry that the interwining of the theoretical and empirical would open the floodgates to bias in science. Human cognizing both historical and the present day is replete with disturbing commitments, including the intolerance and narrow-mindedness of many sorts. If such commitments are integral to the theoretical framework or endemic to the reasoning of scientists or scientific community, they may threaten to corrupt the epistemic utility of empirical results generated using their resources. The core impetus of a value-free ideal is to maintain a safe distance between the appraisal of scientific theories, according to the evidence on one hand, and the swarm of moral, political, social, and economic values on the other. While proponents of the value-free ideal might admit that the motivation to pursue a theory or the legal protection of human subjects in permissible experimental methods involve non-epistemic values, they would contend that such values ought not to enter into the constitution of empirical results themselves, nor the adjudication of justification of scientific theorizing in light of evidence. As a matter of fact, values do enter into science at a variety of stages. Above, we saw that theory latenness could refer to the involvement of theory and perception in semantics and the kind of circularity that some have worried begets on falsifiability and therefore dogmatism. Like theory latenness, values can sometimes do affect judgments about salience of certain evidence and the conceptual framing of data. Indeed, on a permissible construal of the nature of theories, values can simply be understood as part of a theoretical framework. The fact that values do sometimes enter into scientific reasoning does not by itself settle the question of whether it would be better if they did not. In order to assess the normative proposal, philosophers of science have attempted to disambiguate the various ways in which values might be thought to enter into science and the various reference to get crammed into the single headings of values. Anderson, 2004, articulates eight stages of scientific research where values, evaluative presuppositions, might be employed in epistemically fruitful ways. In paraphrase, uh, one, orientation in the field, two, framing a research question, three, conceptualizing the target, four, identifying relevant data, five, data generation, six, data analysis, seven, deciding when to cease data analysis, and eight, drawing conclusions. Similarly, Intamin 2021 lays out five ways that values play a role in scientific reasoning with which feminist philosophers of science have engaged in particular. One, framing of research problems. Two, observing phenomenon in describing data. Three, reasoning about value-laden concepts and assessing risk. Four, adapting particular models. And five, in collecting and interpreting evidence. Ward 2021 presents a streamlined general taxonomy of four ways in which values relate to choice as reasons motivating or justifying choices as causal effectors of choices as good effects affected by choices. By investigating the roles of values in these particular stages or aspects of research, philosophers of science can offer highly higher resolution insight than just the observation that values are involved in science at all and on tangled crosstalk. Similarly, fine points can be made about the nature of values involved in these various contexts. Such clarification is likely important for determining whether the contribution of certain values in a context is deleterious or salutary in, and in what sense. Douglas 2013 argues that the value of internal consistency of a theory and the empirical adequacies of a theory with respect to the available evidence 
and minimal criteria for any viable scientific theory. She contrasts these with the sort of values that Kuhn called virtues, i.e. scope, simplicity, and explanatory power that are properties of theories themselves, and the unification, novel predictions, and precisions, which are properties a theory has in relation to a body of evidence. These are the sort of values that may be relevant to explaining and justifying choices that scientists make to pursue, abandon, or accept, reject particular theories. Moreover, Douglas argues that what she calls non-epistemic values, in particular ethical judgments, also enter into decisions at various stages internal to scientific reasoning, such as data collection and interpretation. Many philosophers accept that values can contribute to the generation of empirical results without spoiling the epistemic utility. Anderson diagnoses that of following deep down what the objectors find worrisome about allowing value judgments to guide scientific inquiry is not that they have evaluative content, but that these judgments might be held dogmatically so as to preclude the recognition of evidence that might undermine them. We need to ensure that value judgments do not operate to drive inquiry to a predetermined conclusion. This is our fundamental criterion for distinguishing legitimate from illegitimate use of value in science. Data production, including experimental design and execution, is heavily influenced by investigators' background assumptions. Sometimes these include theoretical commitments that lead to experimentalists to producing non-illuminating or misleading evidence. In other cases, this may to lead to experimentalists to ignore or even fail to produce useful evidence. The values in play bias the research outcome to preclude recognition of countervailing evidence. Anderson argues that the problematic influence of values comes when research is rigged in advance to confirm certain hypotheses. When the influence of values amounts to incorrigible dogmatism, dogmatism in her sense is on ability in practice, their stubbornness in face of any conceivable evidence. Fortunate such dogmatism is not ubiquitous and when it occurs it could often be corrected eventually. Above we noted that the mere involvement of the theory to be tested in the generation of the empirical results does not automatically yield vicious circularity. It depends on how the theory is involved. Furthermore, even if the assumptions initially made in the generation of empirical results are incorrect, future scientists will have the opportunities to reassess those assumptions in light of new information and techniques. Thus, as long as scientists continue their work, there need to be no time at which the epistemic value of an empirical result can be established once and for all. This should come as no surprise to anyone who is aware that science is fallible, but it is no grounds for skepticism it is perfectly reasonable to trust the evidence available at present, even though it is logically possible for epistemic troubles to arise in the future. A similar point can be made regarding values. Moreover, with the inclusion of values in the generation of empirical result can sometimes be epistemically bad. Values properly deployed can be harmless or even epistemically helpful. By questioning the absolute value of one of the traditional ideals for flourishing families, researchers can garner evidence that have, and might end up destabilizing the empirical foundation supporting the ideal. Reuse. Empirical results are most obviously put to epistemic work in their context of origin. Scientists conceive of empirical research, collect and analyze the relevant data, and then bring the results to bear on the theoretical issues that inspired the research in the first place. However, philosophers have discussed ways in which empirical results are transferred out of their native context and applied in diverse and sometimes unexpected ways. Case of reuse or repurposing of empirical results in different epistemic contexts raise several interesting issues for philosophers of science. For one, such cases challenge the assumption that theory and value ladenness can bind the epistemic utility of empirical results to a particular conceptual framework. Ancient Babylonian eclipse records inscribed in cuneiform tablets have been used to generate constraints on contemporary geophysical theorizing about the causes of the lengthening of the day of Earth, this is surprising since the ancient observations were originally recorded for the purpose of making astrological prognostications. Nevertheless, with enough background information, the records as inscribed can be translated, the layers of assumption baked into their presentation peeled back, and the results repurposed using resources in contemporary epistemic contests, the like of which the Babylonians could have hardly dreamed. Furthermore, the potential for reuse and repurposing feedback on the methodological norms of data production and handling in light of the difficulty of reusing, repurposing data without sufficient background information about the original context 
Goodman, 2014. Note that data reuse is most possible when data, metadata, and information about the process of generating those data, such as code, all, all provided. Indeed, they advocate for sharing data and code in addition to results customarily published in science. As we have seen, the loading of data with theory is usually necessary for putting to putting the data to any serious epistemic use. Theory loading makes theory appraisal possible. Philosophers have begun to appreciate that this epistemic boon does not necessarily come at the cost of rendering data tragically local. But it's important to note that useful travel of data between contexts is significantly aided by foresight curation and management for that aim. In light of the mediated nature of empirical results, Boyd 2018 argues for enriched view of evidence in which evidence serves as a tribunal of experiences understood to be lines of evidence composed of products of data collection and all the products of the transformation, the ways of generation of empirical results are ultimately compared to theoretical predictions, consideration together with metadata associated with their provenance. Such metadata includes information about theoretical assumptions that are made in data collection, processing, and presentation of empirical results. Boyd argues that by appealing to metadata to rewind the processes, processing of assumption imbued empirical results, and then by reprocessing them using new results, the epistemic utility of empirical evidence can survive transitions into new contexts. Thus, the enriched view of evidence supports the idea that it is not despite the interwining of the theoretical and empirical that scientists accomplish key epistemic aims, but in virtue of it. In addition, it makes the epistemic value of metadata encoding the various assumptions that have been made throughout the course of the data collection and processing explicit. The desirability of explicit furnishing empirical data and results with auxiliary information that allow them to travel can be appreciated in light of the objectivity norm construed as accessibility to interpersonal scrutiny. When data are repurposed to novel contexts, they're not only shared between subjects, but they can in some cases be shared across radically different paradigms with incompatible theoretical commitments. The epistemic value of empirical evidence. One of the important applications of empirical evidence as it's used in assessing the epistemic status of scientific theories, in this section we briefly discuss philosophical work on the role of empirical evidence in confirmation falsification of scientific theories, saving the phenomenon, and the appraising of empirical adequacy theories. However, further philosophical work ought to explore the variety of ways in which the empirical results can bear on the epistemic status of theorizing and theories and theorizing and scientific practice beyond these. Confirmation. It is natural to think that computability, range of application to other things being equal, true theories are better than false ones. Good approximations are better than bad ones, and highly probable theoretical claims are better than less probable ones. One way to decide whether a theory or a theoretical claim is true, close to the truth, or acceptable, probable to derive its predictions from its use of empirical data to evaluate them. Hypothetical deductive confirmation theorists proposed that empirical evidence argues for the truth of theories whose deductive consequences it verifies and against those whose consequences it falsifies. But laws and theoretical generalizations seldom, if ever, entail observational predictions unless they are conjoined with one or more auxiliary hypothesis taken from the theory they belong to. When the prediction turns out to be false, the hypothetical deductive model has trouble explaining which of the conjuncts is to blame if the theory entails a true prediction. It will continue to do so in conjunction with the arbitrary selective irrelevant claims. Hypothetical deductivity deductive has trouble explaining why the prediction does not confirm the irrelevancies along with the theory of interest. Another approach to confirmation by empirical evidence is inference to the best explanation. The idea is roughly that an explanation of the evidence that exhibits certain desirable characteristics with respect to a family of candidate explanations is likely to be true. On this approach, it is in virtue of their successive explanation of the empirical evidence that theoretical claims are supported. Naturally, inference to the best explanation advocates face the challenge of defending a suitable characterization of what accounts the best and justifying the limited 
pool of candidate explanations considered. Bayesian approaches to the scientific confirmation have garnered significant attention and are now widespread in philosophy. Bayesians hold that the evidential bearing of empirical evidence on a theoretical claim is to be understood in terms of likelihood or conditional probability. For example, whether empirical evidence argues for a theoretical claim might be thought to depend upon whether it's more probable, and if so, how much more probable than its denial condition on a description of the evidence together with the background beliefs, including theoretical commitments. But by Bayes' theorem, the posterior probability of the claims of interest, that is the probability given the evidence, is proportional to the claim's prior probability. How to justify the choice of these prior probability assignments is one of the most notorious points of contention arising from Bayesians. If one makes the assignment of priors a subjective matter, decided by epistemic agents, agents, then it's not clear that they can be justified. Once again, one's use of evidence to evaluate a theory depends in part upon its theoretical commitments. If one instead appeals to chains of successive updating using Bayes' theorem based on past evidence, one has to evoke assumptions that generally do not obtain the in actual scientific reasoning. For instance, to wash out the influence of priors, a limit theorem is invoked wherein we consider very many updating iterations, but much scientific reasoning of interest does not happen in that limit. And so in practice, priors hold on just justified sway. Rather than attempting to cast out all instances of confirmation based on empirical evidence as belonging to a universal schema, a better approach may be to go local. Norton's material theory of induction argues that induction support arises from background knowledge, that is from material facts that are domain specific. Thus, Norton repeatedly emphasizes that all induction is local. So there are those who may be skeptical about the very possibility of confirmation or of successful induction insofar as the bearing of evidence on theory is never totally decisive. Insofar there is no single trustworthy universal schema that captures empirical support, perhaps the relationship between empirical evidence and scientific theory is not really about support after all. Giving up on empirical support would not automatically mean abandoning any epistemic value for empirical evidence. Rather than confirmation theory, the epistemic role of evidence could be con to constrain, for example, by furnishing phenomenon for theory to systematize or adequately model. Saving the phenomenon. Theories are said to save observable phenomenon if they satisfactory predict, describe, or systematize them. How well the theory performs any of these tasks need not depend on the truth or accuracy of its basic principles. Thus, according to Osiander's preface to Copernicus on the revolutions, a locus classicus astronomers cannot in any way attune, attain the true causes of the regularities among observable astronomical events. One must contend content themselves with saving the phenomena in the sense of using whatever suppositions enable them to compute to be computed correctly from the principles of geometry for the future as well as the past. Theorists are to use those assumptions as calculating tools without committing themselves to their truth. In particular, the assumption that the planets revolve around the sun must be evaluated slowly in terms of how useful it is in calculating the observable relative positions to satisfactory approximation. Pierre Duhem's aim in the structure of physical theory articulates a related, related concept for Duhem of physical theory is a system of mathematical propositions deduced from a small number of principles which aim to represent as simply and completely and exactly as possible a set of experimental laws. Experimental laws are general mathematical descriptions of observable experimental results Investigators produce them by performing, me measuring, and other experimental operations and assigning symbols to perceptible results according to pre-established operational definitions. For Duhem, the main function of a physical theory is to help us store and retrieve information about observables we would not otherwise be able to keep track of. If that is what a theory is supposed to accomplish, its main virtue should be intellectual economy. Theorists start to replace reports of individual observations with experimental laws and devise higher laws, the fewer the better, from which experimental laws, the more the better, can be mathematically derived. The theory's experimental laws can be tested for accuracy and comprehensive by comparing them to observational data. Let EL be one or more experimental laws that perform acceptably well in such tests. Higher level laws can 
then be evaluated on the basis of how well they integrate experimental laws into the rest of the theory. Some data that don't fit integrated experimental laws won't be interesting enough to worry about. Other data may need to accommodate by replacing or modifying one or more experimental laws or adding new ones. If the required additions, modifications, or replacements deliver experimental laws that are harder to integrate the data count against the theory, if they require changes are conducive to improve systemization, the data count in favor of it. If the required changes make no difference, the data don't argue for or against the theory. Empirical adequacy. On Van Frassen's 1980 semantic account, the theory is empirically adequate when the empirical structure of at least one model of the theory is isomorphic to what he calls the appearances. In other words, when the theory has at least one model that all the actual phenomenon fit inside. Thus for Van Frassen, we continually check the empirical adequacy of our theories by seeing if they have the structural resources to accommodate new observations. We'll never know the, that a given theory is totally empirically adequate since for Van Frassen, empirically adequate Adequacy obtains with respect to all that is observable in principle to creatures like us, not all that has already been observed. The primary appeal of dealing in empirical adequacy rather than confirmation is its appropriate epistemic humility. Instead of claiming that confirming evidence justifies belief or boosted confidence that a theory is true, one is restricted to saying that a theory continues to be consistent with the evidence as far as we can tell so far. However, if the epistemic utility of empirical results in appraising the status of theories is just to judge their empirical adequacy, then it may be difficult to account for the difference between adequate but unrealistic theories and those equally adequate theories that ought to be taken seriously as representations. Appealing to extra empirical virtues like parsimony may be the way out, but one that will not appeal to philosophers skeptical to the connotations thereby supposed between such virtues and representation fidelity. Conclusion. An earlier way of thinking observation was to serve as the unmediated foundation of science, direct access to the facts upon which the edifice of scientific knowledge could be built. While conflict arose between factions with different ideological commitments, observation could furnish the material from neutral arbitration and settle the matter objectively in virtue of being independent of non-empirical commitments. According to this view, scientists working in different paradigms could at least appeal to the same observations and propagandists could be held accountable to the publicly accessible content of theory and value-free observations. Despite, despite their different theories, Priestley and Lavoisier could find shared ground in observations. Anti-Semites would be compelled to admit the success of a theory authored by a Jewish physicist in virtue of the unassailable facts revealed by observation. This version of empiricism, empiricism with respect to science does not accord well with the fact that observations per se plays a relatively small role in many actual scientific methodologies and the fact that even the most raw data is often already theoretically imbued. The strict contrast between theory and observation in science is more fruitively supplanted by inquiry into the relationship between theorizing empirical results. Contemporary philosophers of science tend to embrace the theory ladenness of empirical results. Instead of seeing the integration of the theory, theoretical and empirical as an impediment to furthering scientific knowledge, they see it necessary. A view from nowhere would not bear on our particular theories. That is impossible to put empirical results to use without recruiting some theoretical resources in order to use an empirical result to constrain or test a theory, it has to be processed into a form that can be compared to that theory. To get stellar spectrograms to bear Newtonian or relativistic cosmology, they need to be processed into galactic rotation curves. The spectrograms by themselves are just artifacts, pieces of paper. Scientists need theoretical resources in order to even identified that such artifacts bear information relevant to their purposes, and certainly to put them in any epistemic use in assessing theories. This outlook does not render contemporary philosophers of science all constructivists. However, theory mediates the connection between the target of inquiry and the scientific worldview. It does not sever it. Moreover, vigilance is still required to ensure that particular ways in which theory is involved in the production of empirical results are not epistemically de uh, detrimental. Theory can be deployed in experimental design data processing 
and presentation of results in all productive ways, for instance, in determining whether the results were speak for or against a particular theory, regardless of what the world is like. Critical appraisal of the role of theory is thus important for genuine learning about nature through science. Indeed, it seems that extra empirical values can sometimes assist such critical appraisal instead of viewing observation as the theory free and for that theory furnishing the content with which to appraise theories. We might attend to the choices and mistakes that can be made in collecting and generalizing empirical results with the help of theoretical resources, endeavor to make choices conductive, conducive to learning the correct mistakes as we discover them, recognize the involvement of theory and values in the constituation of generation of empirical results does not undermine the special epistemic value of empirical science in contrast to the propaganda of pseudoscience. In cases where the influence of cultural, political, and religious values hinders scientific inquiry, it is often the case that they do so by limiting or determining the nature of empirical results. Yet by working to make assumptions that shape results explicit, we can examine their suitability for purposes and attempt to restructure inquiry as necessary. When disagreements arise, scientists can attempt to settle them by appealing to the causal connections between results, the research target, and the empirical data. The tribunal of experience speaks through empirical results, but it only does through, through via careful fashioning with theoretical resources. Okay, so that was uh, intense. That was a lot. Um, thanks to all the people who stuck out and uh, listened to that. Um, so the first few, I, I might do a few streams like this where I'm largely reading these papers. I actually had more that I'd, I'd wanted to do today, but it's already been close to four hours. So I'm going to have to wrap up here. And that last long, long one about observation and the question of, you know, direct observation or machine observation and data in terms of science and you know the scientific method bringing the philosophy of science up to modern times so you know i read through the basic overview of the philosophy of science and the history of the scientific method and i went into detail about coons you yeah, thanks memes um you were know, hopefully pretty important and you know so there's a lot of information and there's a lot more information this is a really deep topic. And so right now I'm just kind of throwing things out there. A, and, you know, I'm saying for myself, anyone listening to this, you will just see how many ways of understanding science, the scientific method, the philosophy of science, uh, you know, uh, individual questions of observation, uh, data, um, there are many schools of interpretation. And so I'm a, I'm a little overloaded right now to you know, try to attempt to use the multiple truth hypothesis to navigate all these various theories. So generally, I think people you know, just like take a school, like, well, I feel like this, or I, I come from this school, which is kind of uh, the Kuhnian approach where you say, well, you have to choose a paradigm to, to, to work with them. You can't say, well, um, I have my foot in a whole bunch of doors. So, you know, like I'm part of a whole bunch of schools. And whenever something new comes up, new data or something to think about, I have to filter it through a whole bunch of competitive theories. And... So the reality is that that's really what we need to do to progress science forward. Um, you might have to work within a paradigm, but you recognize, okay, so what's the truth value? Uh, you know, the connection between, so to say, truth and um, I should still be going, it looks like one of my computers disconnected. Okay, so I'm about to wrap up here, but uh, 
you know, there's a lot of information here. I'm going to try to continue maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, and I will do part two. And, um, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see, uh, you know, where this leads. So there's a lot of information. So I'm just going to kind of throw it out there, you know, do one stream after the next of throwing this information out there. And then I'm going to try to sift through it and show some of the power of the multiple truth hypothesis. And from there, I'm going to backtrack. So this is just one thing. This is just the philosophy of science. Um, and, and I only got through like less than a quarter of the stuff that I plan to get through just on the philosophy of science, you know, let alone the history of science. And I want to backtrack to metaphysics and philosophy in general. But, uh, you know, I think the um, science is probably the best place to start. And in order to understand science, there's many precursors like, you know, mathematics, geometry, uh, but probably the philosophy of science is the most important, understanding of the scientific method. And then, you know, like memes is working with Stephen Wolfram and, you know, it's really like a Kuhnian paradigm shift that Stephen Wolfram might be attempting to do, where he's saying there's a lot of data, there's a lot of anomalies in the current data in modern physics. And the current theories, it looks like there's more and more anomalies. So with the current paradigm of uh, you know, quantum mechanics or uh, various aspects, and there's really just schools of physics, you know, the attempt of a unification theory, but there's many, many anomalies. And so if someone like Wolfram has a new method, methodology um, that may help to explain, have more explanatory power for some of the anomalies. And then the question is, well, can it all, besides for explaining some of the anomalies, can it explain what is previous, what is currently being explained by the, by the current paradigm that uh, suffers the anomalies? And, you know, so I went in depth on the Kuhnian cycles of the revolution and, you know, that's going to be important also for examining, okay, so the multiple truth hypothesis, you're saying, oh, there's all these theories, all these models, all these schools, and they all have various explanatory power, which I'll generally want to refer to as truth values. Although truth comes from philosophy, that truth is not really a scientific concept, it's a philosophical concept. So how I'm going to get into truth being connected to um, you know, the philosophy of science, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to widen the spectrum. So, uh, but, but uh, you know, say, so to say, like a truth claim where you could look, well, it has explanatory power. There's, you know, they call induction inference to the best explanation. However, there's no universal explanation. There's no theory of everything that explains everything. There's just certain phenomenon that are explained best by certain theories, and those theories may have diminishing return as they're applied to wider and wider spectrums of phenomenon. And then you have other theories that might explain other phenomenon better. So, you know, call like a paradigm shift first, like an attempt at unification. How do you combine one called theory model? that relatively accurately descri describes one phenomenon, but has failures for explaining other phenomenon versus another model or theory that might accurately explain the phenomenon that the one model uh, didn't properly explain, but then have problems describing the uh, phenomenon that the other model did. So you have a problem and To a large extent, all of science is like that right now. Um, you know, there's certain things that have been unified. There's certain phenomena that's well explained. And next time I want to get into engineering and technology where you'll say, well, okay, well, what, what what's the role of technology? And I'll look at the Greeks like episteme and techne.
in you know the ancient time were like know how in in terms of understanding things and being able to do things and that also you know to another topic i, I plan on getting into soon which is the the science and theory of expertise um but i'm going to go forward with uh probably a few streams another two three four streams on the philosophy of science it's a big topic there's a lot to cover um some of it's pretty intense and then once I'm done with that, I'll probably backtrack to some of the epochs in the scientific revolution and you know try to look at those and understand like you know Newton and uh, and then uh, you know, maybe like uh, the conservation of energy and uh, you know Hilbert's uh, uh, attempt at the axiomatization of physics in various issues and with you know this, understanding of the philosoph philosophy of science to look at those more in depth and then from there i want to get what i really want to get to is to the unification of spiritual and scientific topics so the main reason why we have to do an in-depth analysis of the philosophy of science is to show the boundaries of science and when you're making truth claims because okay well science has truth claims about certain phenomenon but maybe has very little to say about other phenomenon but there's a crossover there's intersection there you know blurred boundaries and science might have informed some metaphysics like there might be metaphysical philosophical explanations about um you would call like primary qu qualities versus secondary qualities and uh in you know, so we'll get more into that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to cover. So appreciate everyone tuned in. And uh, you know, hopefully Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm going to do another part in this. So uh, hopefully tomorrow I'll add uh, table of contents. And, uh, you know, so God bless. And you should have weekend review on Thursday. And we'll see what Jennifer is changing schedule, what happens with that uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, check, uh, you know, join my Discord or, you know, reach out, put comments on the video or you can reach out on Facebook, uh, Twitter, any of the social media and, you know, feedback and, and hopefully we'll create a community because uh, there's not really good content on these subjects. One of the main reasons I'm doing this is because I've exhausted most of the content out there. And, and like, you know, I have like hundreds of books I'm reading too. So I'm just, you know, reading these articles to, uh, you know, for some basis, like, uh, you know, I, hopefully I'm going to try writing my own articles, but as of now, like, you know, that's very time consuming. And so I just wanted to put this out there, uh, work it through myself uh, publicly and hopefully be of some use to, you know, people, you know, kind of like a book on tape or people who just want, uh, you know, some information. So today I didn't give that much discussion of these topics. This is the first on the stream and I'm, uh, you know, personally a little discombobulated or unorganized and how I'm going to structure this. So hopefully as it goes through, I'll have more insight and, uh, you know, see me able to get more feedback and uh, see where it goes. So God bless everyone. Have a great weekend uh, or a great week. And uh, hopefully I'll see you probably Tuesday or Wednesday to, uh, for another one of these. And I think we can review this week is going to be Thursday at seven o'clock ET.